Thank you everyone for coming to the evening session. Um, for those of you who weren't here uh, for the excellent sessions in the morning or early afternoon east or mid afternoon Eastern time, uh, we'll, we have recorded them and we'll make this public. And I just wanna say a couple of brief words about kind of what this is and how it came together. Uh, so like many of you, um, we, as a reading group kind of came together, um, thanks to Alex who started it. And there was a great core group of Alex, Alejo, David, uh, Justin, and myself. And we had this idea of what if we ask some great Althusserian scholars whose work we admired uh, to come and speak with us for a conference. And lo and behold, um, we got uh, responses back and people were so kind and so generous. And um, I just couldn't thank them enough. It was a great silver lining of being stuck on Zoom in a pandemic. Um, and also uh, I would like to acknowledge it's the International Women's Day, the International Women's Strike. And uh, we had two great interventions on Althusserian theory and feminism uh, from Natalia Rome and Robin Morasco. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, the three speakers for this evening. And then uh, without further ado, um, we'll go into that. Uh, so the first speaker will be Adrian Johnson uh, with his paper, Althusser contra Gramsci, uh, reprioritizing the critique of political economy. Dr. Johnson is the distinguished chair and professor of philosophy at the University of New Mexico and a faculty member at the Emory Psychoanalytic Institute in Atlanta. He is the author of many texts uh, ranging from German idealism to psychoanalysis to historical materialism, a uh, couple of selections, the most recent of which are uh, Prolegomena to Any Future Materialism, Volume 2, A Weak Nature Alone, and A New German Idealism, Hegel, Zizek, and Dialectical Materialism. He's also a co-editor with Todd McGowan and Slavoj Zizek of Diaresis at Northwestern University Press. Our second speaker will be Warren Montag, who will be presenting a talk, What is Orientation in Politics? Althusser's Line of Demarcation during the evening panel. Dr. Montag is the Lewis and Brown Family Professor of Literature, English, and Comparative Literary Studies at Occidental College in Los Angeles. He is the author of Louis Althusser, Bodies, Masses, Power, Spinoza and his contemporaries, and the unthinkable Swift. Uh, he's also the editor of Dr. Laws, a journal of Althusser studies, and he's currently working on a book on Spinoza and the materialism of the letter. And our last speaker will be Nathan Brown, who will be presenting a paper called The Analytic of Separation. Dr. Brown is professor of English in the Canada Research Chair in Poetics at Concordia University in Montreal where he directs the Center for Expanded Poetics. He is the author of Rationalist Empiricism, A Theory of Speculative Critique, and The Limits of Fabrication, Material Science, and Materialist Poetics. Uh, he's working on the translation of Les Fleurs de Mal and a companion book called Baudelaire's Shadow, an essay on poetic determination, which will be out in fall of 2021 by MAMA. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Adrian for the first talk. Thank you. All right. Uh, am I successfully unmuted? Yes. All right. So you said I would be presenting a paper. I don't actually have a paper put together. I do have some notes and the intention to improvise something which hopefully will be uh, a, approximately as coherent as a paper, or at least as what I could manage to write during this period in which I am a department chair with two young children during a pandemic. Um, and if time permits, I might even be able to touch on a few snippets or a part of a book that I had hoped to finish until COVID-19 uh interrupted things um, but that i now hope to finish uh this this coming summer dealing with the intersections between marxism and psychoanalysis um now the title of my presentation today uh althusser contra gramsci reprioritizing the critique of political economy um 
already indicates that what I am going to be focusing on in, in my presentation uh, is Althusser's recently published, it appeared in French in 2018 and in English translation just a couple of months ago in December 2020, um, the 1978 manuscript uh, entitled Que faire? What is to be done? Uh, and therein, those of you who have read this, you, you will be aware of it, but for those of you who haven't had a chance yet, given the relatively recent status of this publication, um, that you will find therein uh, Althusser mounting a scathing critique of a hero, a darling of Western Marxism and contemporary leftism, namely none other than Antonio Gramsci. And for many, uh, including people relatively familiar with Althusser, but especially for those whose acquaintance with him is limited more or less to, in particular, what I expect, especially given when Althusser is taught to undergraduates, is um, his single most widely read text, uh, the essay, Ideology and Ideological State Apparatuses, um, that given that Althusser uh, and the fact that the essay on the ISAs, as well as the longer manuscript from which it was taken on, on the reproduction of capitalism, um, clearly has significant debt to Gramsci and is and seems much more positively disposed to the Gramscian legacy and, and really redeploys it in a certain way in terms of Althusser's account of quote unquote ideology and ideological state apparatuses. Um, that the fact that Gramsci comes in for such harsh treatment in 1978's Kaffir, um, perhaps uh, it's, it's likely to catch some of his readers off guard. Um, but I think that there are some very important points that Althusser makes in this set of criticisms of Gramsci from this 1978 manuscript um, that are especially relevant uh, uh, in the context of an event uh, that is entitled Reading Althusser Politically. Um, and I you know, want to really draw out what I think are the you know, urgent, you know, pressing contemporary implications of this later Althusserian critique of the Gramsci of the prison notebooks uh, you know, in the course of my presentation, but also at the same time situate this in relation to the context of European Marxism uh, from the early decades of the 20th century you know, up throughout Althusser and even beyond in, uh, into recent and contemporary permutations of the Western Marxist tradition. Um, now, I, I, along with you know, complementing uh, the Althusser of uh, I I would interpret the what is almost I would I would risk saying the excessive valorization, even worship at times, of a certain version of the figure of Gramsci as the author of the prison notebooks. Um, this valorization I see as symptomatic of problems on the linked levels of both theory and practice plaguing contemporary variants of, of leftism, of radical leftism, uh, and whose radicality I think is somewhat compromised by what is involved in this elevation of Gramsci to you know, an, an almost saintly figure uh, in, in the Marxist canon. Um, and one thing that uh, you know, I would begin by highlighting here apropos Althusser's critique of Gramsci and especially the Gramsci I have in mind who is valorized uh, by various currents of especially yes, yes, yes. Marxism. Pardon? Oh, I, I'm sorry, I heard somebody's voice okay. for a second. <laughs> All right. um, that at one point in, in what is to be done, um, and here I don't have the English translation yet, but uh, on the, uh, in the French edition, it's on page 88. Um, at one point, Althusser pays Gramsci uh, a backhanded compliment and says he achieved such originality um, that he managed to, in his path-breaking, pioneering inventiveness, to actually just leave Marx behind and to lose contact uh, with Marxism. And and one way that you know one could uh, paraphrase this is to say that in in essence, you know, else is there. You know, at a time when you already have emerging certain variants of post-Marxism, uh, you know, especially you know what is associated with figures like Leclerc, Mouffe, etc that uh, you know, the later Althusser is indicating that in a way, um, the post-Marxist reliance on Gramsci, I mean, and the fact that for instance, you know, the Gramscian account of hegemony looms so large in Leclauian radical uh, uh, democratic post-Marxism, uh, that 
um, basically Althazer is saying, well, yes, in, in a sense, Gramsci was already, albeit avant la lettre, the first post-Marxist in this sense. And moreover, it's a sense in which, according to this Althusser, you know, of course, with the with the prefix post, you know, it, it can mean on the one hand leaving behind and on the other hand carrying forward. That it, you know, like you know, Hegel's Aufhebung, you know, it can you know, it, it can convey you know, on the one hand, con uh, continuity, and on the other hand, discontinuity. Um, and I think on Althusser's assessment, Gramsci's post-Marxism of la lettre uh, goes too far in the direction of post in the sense of leaving behind rather than carrying forward, hence Gramsci's quote-unquote originality. Um, and you know, of course, this has everything to do uh, on Althusser's assessment um, with the manner in which Gramsci replaces certain core components of classical historical materialism, including that of Marx and Engels themselves, um, with a set of terms slash concepts that in Althusser's view, uh, basically get rid of the emphasis on the economy that is, you know, however one needs to qualify it, nonetheless would seem to be a really core distinguishing component of Marxism by contrast with any number of other approaches. Um, you know, if you completely eliminate any prioritization of the economy whatsoever, then it seems as though you're open to, to having to answer the questions along the lines of, well, you know, why not just, for instance, opt to embracing, you know, Weber, you know, or flashing forward other, you know, non-Marxist social theorists, you know, who would say, oh, well, you know, you just have an array of different forces and factors and in different contexts or different points in social history, you know, certain conjunctures, there'll be some that predominate over others, but there's no, no prioritization, no inherent um, uh, uh, you know, essential priority to be granted to any one or, or several of these over others. Um, you know, at that point, you really, I mean, Marx is, in, in a way, in, in some respects, a superfluous point of reference. And it's really hard to say that you, at that point, remain a historical materialist. Um, and Althusser, when critiquing Gramsci in the context of, of this 1978 manuscript, Kefer, um, you know, things that you know, Althusser points out and said, okay, well, in Gramsci's struggle against uh, the economism, both of the Second International and of Stalinism, um, that he goes so far in the direction of valorizing superstructure over infrastructure um, that it, he even at certain points, Althusser alleges, uh, seems to just erase infrastructure altogether. And that instead of historical materialism with however qualified its emphasis, on the you know, infrastructural mode of production as having a certain foundational grounding role as the base of all social structure, uh, you get instead this quote unquote philosophy of praxis um, that instead of talking about modes of production just simply speaks of historical blocks and their civil societies. And Althusser is at pains to point out in this manuscript of his from his later period uh, that um, with, you know, historical block, I mean, what Gramsci seeks to do is, in a sense, you know, eliminate the, the need to talk about a distinction or a priority, you know, in terms of the relationship between infrastructure and superstructure and say, well, you've just got these organically connected structural holes that might have these different dimensions, but that are so inextricably intertwined in, in relations of reciprocal codependence that one can you know, no longer prioritize infrastructure in the way that any kind of Marxist economism, again, whether second international, Stalinist or whatever, whatever other variety, such that there can be no privileging allowed of, of the infrastructure whatsoever. And that likewise, Althusser argues when Gramsci speaks of civil society, um, that there's just this, this deafening silence, this, this glaring blank in terms of no reference to economic institutions and practices or sets of economic relations in the discourse about civil society that one finds in the Gramsci of the prison notebooks as well. Um, and of course, you know, when we look at how, for instance, someone like LeCloud takes up Gramsci's legacy, you know, in conjunction with ingredients borrowed from, you know, non-Marxist strains of post-war French thought, et cetera, um, that, you know, indeed, you know, you, one can see that Althusser's worries about Gramsci, 
you know, appear to be not without their justifications. Now, I will admit there are places one can find in Gramsci's writings, particularly in the prison notebooks, where, you know, you, you can see exceptions to this. My sense is Althusser would say, fine, at certain moments, Gramsci will attempt to, you know, still hold on to some qualified sense of the importance of the economy a la Marxist historical materialism, but these for Althusser would be too few, too, you know, too far between, and would not be, you know, developed enough to really offset the fact that Gramsci so massively uh, emphasizes superstructure over infrastructure in combating economism. Um, and that, you know, in response to this Gramsci, one would need to, as Lenin would like to put it, bend the stick back in the other direction to correct the imbalance in favor of superstructure in Gramsci. Um, of course, I should also mention that a forerunner of this Gramsci, who doesn't feature in, at least in this text by Althusser critiquing Gramsci, um, would be especially the, the Karl Korsch of 1923's Marxism and philosophy, um, you know, who, you know, already, you know, in a sense, foreshadows some of these arguments against economism and in favor of prioritizing in a way that it was, it was thought, you know, in, especially in Gelsian Marxism, and then, you know, Bolshevik versions of this, such as Bukharin's 1921 uh, teaching manual on historical materialism, you know, it's this more kind of mechanistic, reductive, economic essentialism um, that Korsh already in 1923 and in a way that got him into trouble with the Soviets, with Zinoviev, um, you know, is already trying to elevate superstructure to a much more prominent position in a way that anticipates what Gramsci does soon after in the prison notebooks in ways that then worry uh, Althusser circa 1978. Um, but some of what we have in the contemporary leftist landscape does seem to bear out, you know, these concerns on Althusser's part, because, you know, if we look at, at you know, the panorama of various forms of contemporary radical leftism, um, we have, you know, a whole series of non, uh, you know, non-economic, even, you know, anti-economic essentialist uh, theories and practices under headings such as identity politics, intersectionality, et cetera. Um, and that, of course, when you look at the influence of someone like Leclau, who who's left populism, uh, you know, inspired by Gramsci and, and a certain appropriation of the Gramscian theory of hegemony, um, you know, has had quite an influence, including, you know, being, you know, very much, uh, you know, essential to the thinking of, uh, you know, uh, the Bolivarian, you know, Chavista movement in Venezuela, etc. Um, and, you know, and moreover, you know, other figures take, for instance, uh, even though he doesn't, you know, trace his Marxist lineage in the same way, but I mean, you take a figure like Badiou, who insists on the purity of politics with it being not only at a distance from the state, but also uh, divorced from any sense of, of economic conditioning of political events and subjectivities. Um, that we have, you know, this whole, and there are many other examples that could be given, but in the interest of time, I'll just simply, you know, make a sweeping gesture in the direction of this whole range of both, you know, you might say, academic and, and non-academic theoretical and practical currents of radical leftism, you know, that indeed, you know, uh, you know, can be seen as, you know, present day descendants of this line of anti-economistic Western Marxism that, you know, Gramsci is an early leading representative of. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in, with Althusser, I think Althusser is justified in what is to be done in arguing that, you know, essentially Gramsci sets things up so that we are supposedly forced to choose uh, between either the kind of mechanistic, reductive economic essentialism of, of a figure like, you know, the, uh, the Bukharin of 1921's historical materialism, you know, or basically repudiating the very distinction, you know, absorbing, you know, the, the, the distinction between infrastructure and superstructure into talk of historical blocks with their civil societies um, and eschewing any prioritization of the economy um, in, in a way that, you know, for, uh, you know, for Althusser just makes this into a false dilemma. And that, you know, Althusser indicates without fully spelling out, you could have a, a, a a properly qualified account 
of, a, of the prioritization of the economy more in line with Marx's own historical materialism um, that nonetheless did not just lapse into the crudeness, the vulgarity of something like, uh, you know, Bukharin's version that, of course, Gramsci is, is able to score points against with, with, with relative ease in the prison notebooks. And I think there's something fundamentally correct about this intuition on the part of the later Althus there. Now, um, you know, of course, between Gramsci himself and then such recent and contemporary figures uh, as as Leclau and 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 as you know certain sorts of non-economic leftist political theory and practice that are part of our contemporary landscape. Of course, in between, you have a whole set of developments assumed under Merleau-Ponty's perhaps all too convenient heading of Western Marxism, um, and especially particular German and French currents to this with on the German side, obviously. Frankfurt School critical theory and its permutations, and on the French side, various existential and or phenomenological engagements uh, with Marxism. And that, you know, before you get Althusser in, in uh, you know, uh, uh, what is to be done, uh, uh, condemning this sort of current that, uh, you know, that it, it Gramsci he sees as a key initiator of, you know, in terms of the extreme downplaying of the economy uh, that Althusser thinks goes too far uh, in the direction of downplaying it. That you already have the, the later Lukács, the post 1923 after history and class consciousness, Lukács, who I think is wrongly, by the way, who is wrongly dismissed by many Western Marxists and continental philosophical readers of European Marxism, you know, who tend to have this split where you get, for instance, all right, there's Marx, who's like the good historical materialist, and then there's the horrible bastardizer of him, Engels, who is to be dismissed. Likewise, with Lenin, you get the same kind of almost like Kleinian object relations theory splitting operation, you know, between the good Lenin of the philosophical notebooks as the, as the subtle dialectician versus the bad Lenin of 1908's materialism and imperial criticism with its, you know, militancy on behalf of a materialism that is emphasized much more than dialectics. Um, and, uh, you know, furthermore, with Lukács, you have the same splitting operation. You have the good Lukács of 1923's history and class consciousness, and then everything after that is taken to be basically compromise, kowtowing, betrayal in the face of political pressure uh, from Moscow, uh, you know, and that, you know, when, when Lukács, along with Korsh, was condemned by Zinoviev in 1924, you know, that thereafter he just engaged in, um, you know, an attempt essentially to, you know, to, you know, avoid, you know, falling into the party's permanent bad graces with all the consequences that would bring with it. And I think that, no, there's much in the post-1923 Lukács that's very valuable. And moreover, that resonates with the sort of position that Althusser is staking out here. I mean, of course, with the later Lukács, you have you know, apropos French currents of Western Marxism, you know, his outright public condemnation in an open letter in 1956 that he published, uh, uh, denouncing the Merleau-Ponty of 1955's Adventures of the Dialectic, and also objecting to Merleau-Ponty's attempt to elevate history and class consciousness to Lukács's, you know, one and only main contribution uh, to the Marx this tradition, as well as, of course, apropos the German side, uh, Lukács's dismissal of the Frankfurt School of Adorno et al. as, as the very comfortable uh, residence of the Hotel Grand Abyss. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, honestly, I am rather sympathetic to this, you know, line of later Lukácsian criticism that I think Thing can also be detected, uh, uh, you know, in terms of cross resonances with the Althusser, who I'm focused on. Um, by the way, Brendan, how much time do I have left? I realized I failed to keep track. Um, we're taking it easy in terms of time, so we can stretch it a little bit. Um, but maybe now would be a good time to start closing, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Okay, so yes, I will. You know, move in the direction of of closing. Um, so, um, you know what. Basically, to cut to the chase, skipping over a few intermediate links, but I'd be happy to uh, make those explicit if asked to in in, in the discussion to follow. Uh, you know, I would say you know, siding with both this later Lukács and the Althusser, who is harshly critical of, of Gramsci in what is to be done. Um, that I would argue that essentially, you know, what has happened in terms of the trajectory of Western Marxism is that starting with the young Lukács, the Lukács of specifically history and class consciousness, 
as well as the Gramsci of the prison notebooks and also the course of Marxism and philosophy, um, there's actually this interesting uh, 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 set of tensions and the very origins of this of, of, of the trajectory of 20th century European Marxism, you know, including what's then you know led up to certain things that are part of our current situation, um, that you know can be seen in terms of issues having to do with c concerns over economism um, and with it, you know, uh, 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 hand wringing about various kinds of reductionism. And if you look at within the young Lukacs himself, you can you can see a tension in history and class consciousness, um, you know, between, you know, on the one hand, the, what the, you know, Lukács shares with the other founding figures of, of Western Marxism, especially Korshin and, and uh, uh, Gramsci, uh, the rejection of any kind of crudely reductive economism, again, whether of second international or Stalinist varieties. Um, uh, but of course, not Stalin quite yet, since it's 1923. Um, but uh, uh, at, at the same time, of course, the most famous chapter of history and class consciousness um, is the one on reification. Uh, and of course, what is the lesson of reification a la Lukács, whatever later self-critical uh, uh, caveats he attaches to it after 1923? Well, it's that you know what starts at the level of the economy in terms of the commodity form doesn't stay there, that it basically spreads out and colonizes. It in a sense reduces all of the rest of social reality under capitalism uh, you know, to this, this form of alienating you know, thingification, Dinglichum, and that we get, uh, you know, and that with reification, we get the emphasis on the fact that indeed capitalism is objectively reductionistic in terms of how it operates. Um, and so that would seem to call for instead of worrying about a historical materialism as a theory, first and foremost, of capitalist society and its history, um, that it would seem as though de, you know, being worried about having an anti-reductive historical materialism while at the same time acknowledging that capitalism itself is really objectively in and of itself reductionistic and economically reductionistic, um, that that indicates that there's a bit of a problematic tension there. Um, and that you know here I can't help but think of so in 2004 um, on The Daily Show, this is now a very dated reference, um, but you know, back when uh, George W. Bush's Iraq war started to take a turn for the significantly worse in terms of, of Bush's plans and purposes, um, the uh, correspondent Rob Corddry in dialogue with John Stewart as the then host of this program um, was playing a reporter who was covering the Iraq war and who at one point says to Stewart, um, you see, John, you know, what, we, what we're currently struggling with in reporting on the war here is that, uh, you know, the facts themselves are biased, that the facts of the war are showing an alarming anti-Bush bias, right? And I would say that in a certain way too, like apropos, you know, capitalism, it's that, well, you know, it's not that, it, you know, a reductionistic theory is necessarily wrong when what you're dealing with is a reality that in and of itself is actually reductionistic, is that, you know, capitalism itself has this very reductionistic agenda. Um, and, it, it, you know, a theory that insists on being anti-reductive and rejects economism entirely um, is likely to be in certain very problematic ways out of step with its target object of inquiry. Um, and to me, one of the real ironies is starting with, with the young Lukács and coloring a lot of Western Marxism is that they end up being anti-reductive where they should be reductive, namely in terms of a historical materialist theorization of an object, namely capitalist society, that is itself inherently reductionistic in its very reality. I mean, here I'd almost call for a notion of real reduction to you know, complement the sone reckle notion of real abstraction. Um, and then it is reductive where it should be anti-reductive, namely in starting with the young Lukács, the repudiation of anything along the lines of Engels' dialectics of nature, and with that essentially seeding all of, of, of non-human nature to the explanatory jurisdiction of non-dialectical uh, uh, you know, scientific approaches. And, you know, I think that there are arguments that even the late Lukács in the ontology of social being, for instance, you know, when he embraces this, uh, this tradition of dialectical materialism that he rubbished in his youth, uh, you know, indicating that that's a mistake in terms of, you know, saying that, all right, basically a really crude, reductive, non-dialectical, you know, Festan type natural scientific thinking does justice to nature and dialectics and all of its subtlety will be reserved for social history alone. Um, and so here, you know, I think almost one would be better off having a reductive historical materialism coupled with, of course, a 
vehemently anti-reductive dialectical materials that kind of nature apart from society. Um, and some of my own work kind of pleads in that direction. And then the other alternate conception of nature in the Western Marxist tradition, like what you have in certain versions of Frankfurt School theorizing, is basically, you know, Coletti, I think, had some justification when he was a Marxist saying that the Frankfurt School was just another chapter in the long history of German romanticism, you know, a kind of romantic conception of nature, which is also not, you know, I would say, from the standpoint of anyone indebted to the tradition of dialectical thinking, including dialectically conceiving nature, beginning with Hegel and Schelling and continuing through Engels onward, um, is also, you know, for various reasons, somewhat dissatisfying. But I will stop myself now. Sorry if I ran long. Thank you, Brendan. Um, let's just end here. Thank you, Adrian. Um, so um, we'll move on with the panel talks, and then we'll take a short break and have Q&A. Um, so next, I would like to introduce Warren Montag uh, with his talk, What is Orientation in Politics? Altuzir's Line of Demarcation. So thank you, Dr. Montag. Okay, can, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers uh, for putting on this very, very interesting conference, and it's wonderful to see so many old friends out there in the audience, and uh, I hope this will be of interest. Okay, uh, perhaps the position of the left in the present conjuncture, insofar as this conjuncture is composed of, and indeed dominated by, unprecedented events and forces, is best understood in the terms of Kant's essay, Was heißt sich im Denken orientieren? What is meant by orientation in thinking from uh, 1786. In it, Kant asks us to imagine a scenario in which we have left the familiar objects of experience behind. Quote, in the dark, I orient myself in a room that is familiar to me, if I can take hold of even one single object whose position I remember. But it is plain that nothing helps me here except the faculty for determining position according to a subjective ground of differentiation, that is, distinguishing my left from my right. For I do not see at all the objects whose place I am to find. And if someone, as a joke, had moved all the objects around so that what was previously on the right was now on the left, I would be quite unable to find anything in a room whose walls were otherwise wholly identical. But I can soon orient myself through the mere feeling of a difference between my two sides, the right and the left, unquote. We too find ourselves in a kind of darkness, perhaps the most profound darkness of all, a conceptual darkness in which the political conjuncture has not only moved the familiar objects around, but has replaced them with a series of unfamiliar objects in unfamiliar places. To speak of the US for a moment in particular, a pandemic whose rates of transmission and mortality revealed both the extent of the neoliberal pillaging of the entire infrastructure of healthcare and its ability to mobilize a mass movement in defense of its profits. In addition, the Black Lives Matter protests in response to the killings of George Floyd and Ahmed Arbery overdetermined uh, certainly by the abandonment and exposure of the African-American and Latinx communities to the ravage of COVID-19. And finally, the armed white supremacist movements that united in opposition to various measures designed to stop the spread of COVID-19, as well as in opposition to the Black Lives Matter demonstrations as soon as they began to decrease in number and size, leading finally to the attempt to prevent the certification of the 2020 election with the aim of securing a second term for Trump. These developments, each endowed with its own singular complexity and therefore irreducible to apparent, other apparently similar past developments, have produced as a cumulative effect the condition that Kant imagines could come into existence only as a trick someone has played on us the experience of total darkness without identifiable reference points. We cannot choose the position from which we begin to find our way, 
but we can call on what Kant calls the feeling of difference or the subjective ground of difference, although on the condition that we understand that difference as already indelibly inscribed within us, not by subjective experience, individual or collective, but by the experience that is simultaneously subjective and objective of class struggle in the very broadest sense. It is not difficult to identify the place of maximum orientation today, where the imperative to locate the far right in the US in an already existing taxonomy of political forms represents one of the most formidable obstacles to the apprehension of the still developing and mutating tendencies of which it is composed. The apprehension to which I refer has nothing to do with the classification or formal differentiation of elements and functions, although it allows us to understand the political and strategic function of the recourse to taxonomy in the current conjuncture. Instead, it is the apprehension of how these tendencies increase their capacity to move both minds and bodies, the strategies and tactics they employ, often unintentionally without being able to articulate them, to selectively mobilize or demobilize the forces in play. This approach is not the abandonment of historical definition, but its precondition because what we discover about the present may well transform the concepts we have inherited from the past. Although we are disoriented by the tricks we have in fact played upon ourselves, we have the means to begin to orient ourselves politically, that is both theory, in theory and practice, in the darkness of what has been variously called fascism, neo-fascism, proto-fascism, quasi-fascism, pseudo-fascism, white supremacy, white nationalism, white Christian nationalism, authoritarian populism, and authoritarian neoliberalism. And I'm sure that's not an exhaustive list. To modify Kant's formula, I will argue that we can orient ourselves not merely on the basis of a feeling of difference, but with the help of a specific difference inscribed in a line of demarcation drawn by Althusser half a century ago in the well-known essay, Ideology and the Ideological State Apparatuses. He did so by means of his thesis that ideology has a material existence. This thesis, the second of two theses preliminary to what he calls, quote, my central thesis on the structure and functioning of ideology, which is interpolation, is often overlooked by commentators with the result that the extent of Althusser's break with earlier notions of ideology has been obscured. More importantly, we know now that Althusser's thesis did not arise from philosophical reflection alone. Thanks to a forthcoming study by Giacomo Clemente, uh, who I think is, uh, I know is uh, uh, Vittorio Morfino's student, uh, his study of Althusser's published and unpublished writing on education and the university, it has become clear that the thesis concerning the material existence of ideology formulated in 1970, which contradicts the positions expressed in his earlier published statements on the transition, sorry, the transmission of knowledge in the university. He published essays in 1954 and 1964, that these were the direct result of the pressure of repeated student mobilizations against the material, spatial, and temporal organization of academic hierarchy and authority, that is the university as the site of discipline and surveillance in Foucault's sense and as a an ISA as uh, Althusser understood it. The written record of Althusser's reflections on the university shows that the concept of l'appareil scolaire, the educational or scholarly apparatus or state apparatus, initially took shape in the very student demands and criticisms that he initially rejected. And that perhaps only the importance he accorded to the student's critique of the university in the Cultural Revolution, the Chinese Cultural Revolution, combined with the power of the May Revolt convinced him to accept. Although the term ideology appears far less frequently today than was the case in 1970, in part because of the suspicions engendered by Althusser's essay, its place in all the diverse forms of Marxism 
in the immediate aftermath of May 68 made it necessary for him to intervene in the whole question of ideology to allow something new to be said about it. And we should be clear that the diminishing frequency of the term in our time in no way signals a diminution of the power of the cluster of concepts from which the notion of ideology drew its meaning. It was for this reason that Althusser in, in the ISA's essay identified and assembled certain key concepts related to ideology in the form of a kind of table, assigning each of them to one of three categories. One, concepts that have disappeared or perhaps should disappear from his exposition. Two, concepts that have survived, uh, perhaps in some modified form. And three, those that have appeared unexpectedly uh, because they were not usually thought of in, in conjunction with the idea of ideology. Of course, as is uh, typical of Althusser, his attempt at schematization in no way corresponds to the actual presence or absence of these terms in the text. He declares that the term ideas has, has disappeared, while in fact it appears 24 times, uh, most of which occur after he has declared that it has disappeared. Consciousness, declared to have survived, appears in contrast only 15 times. Further, Althusser places quotation marks around ideas in seven of the 24 occurrences and around consciousness in five of the 15 occurrences. And it's, it's difficult, uh, I think it's impossible to uh, determine why, what the logic of the, uh, the quotation marks or their absence uh, is, is finally about. In fact, both terms survive as if we cannot really do without them but at the cost of being placed sur atur, that is, of being allowed to stand, but crossed out. It's a concept, uh, well, from Heidegger, but also uh, from Derrida, where uh, Althusser got it. Uh, being allowed to stand as stand-in concepts, necessary at present, but indelibly marked as inadequate in that they are vague enough not to serve as the foundation for a chain of errors, but specific enough to occupy the place of the missing concept whose lack it is essential to note. And that's uh, an idea that he took from uh, Lenin, uh, materialism and imperial criticism. It may be that fascism for us understood as anything other than a state form belonging to a particular historical moment is one of these temporarily necessary but finally inadequate concepts. The attempt to save certain terms from disappearing uh, because th their disappearance only means that their, their place will be taken by even more dubious and potentially harmful words and concepts is certainly justifiable from Althusser's perspective, but it is now clear that this action served to obscure the very reality that his intervention makes visible. He traced a line of demarcation that revealed the contradiction at the heart of the notion of ideology in Marxism, whose consequences for political action are significant. On the one side, ideology as a system of false ideas, false consciousness, or illusions that further lead individuals to act in such a way as to reproduce their own subjection. On the other hand, ideology as the material existence of ideas and consciousness only in apparatuses, practices, rituals, and liturgies. I would argue that it is this difference or distinction that will allow us to orient ourselves in theory and practice in the absence of familiar landmarks, even when we fail to note their absence on the condition that we continue to work on this difference. What does it mean to treat this thing signified by the word fascism as it exists today as having an entirely material existence that is without recourse to notions like ideas, beliefs, or consciousness as they are conventionally understood. Althusser says it quite directly, an individual's ideas, quote, are his material actions, unquote, which are in turn, quote, inserted into material practices, unquote, that are collective in nature. 
This is a materialism of which the model of basin superstructure is nothing more than a distant anticipation. While this model marks an advance over any notion that ideas are independent of their material circumstances and as such can be dispelled or changed by critique, the form of dependence that the base superstructure model confers on ideas renders them nothing more than expressions whose reality lies outside of them. For Althusser, what was traditionally, or what was in a in certain text by Marx called the superstructure, consists of material practices themselves composed of material actions from which ideas cannot be separated. Only when these practices are disturbed and disrupted by revolt, no matter how inchoate or inarticulate, is effective critique possible. From this follows the very sobering conclusion that the power of ideas, the power to persuade, to convince, to move to action, is nothing more than the power exercised by the practices with which these ideas are consubstantial. Meaning that the greater the ability of a movement to produce practical effects, even to realize in practice a critique that is yet to be formulated, the greater the power of its ideas, the greater its attraction and ability to persuade. To understand these phenomena, well, we will have to set aside every notion of the omnipotence of true ideas or of the optimalizing logic of the marketplace of ideas. The fact that these notions, even on the left, have enjoyed new currency at the very moment that, that far-right violence is a greater threat to the left and to communities of color than at any time since World War II should not come as a surprise. It is in no small part the effect of the fear, intimidation, and demoralization that racist and neo-fascist groups very deliberately aim to produce. It is not my objective here to define the contemporary forms of neo-fascism or white supremacy, whatever we want to call them, or describe their organizations. At this point, it is sufficient to indicate the points of convergen convergence that make possible an objective alliance between them, despite differences in tactical orientation or even matters of principle. The strategic repertoire of the various tendencies of which it is composed is quite similar to that of interwar fascism in the last century. Excuse me. That is a combination of force and persuasion, mass mobilization and street violence on the one hand, and electoral and propaganda campaigns on the other. The effects of these movements today, however, are significantly magnified by their virtual presence. Both the quantity and qualitative effects of what we might call acts of symbolic or discursive violence against perceived adversaries, whether groups or individuals, have increased exponentially essentially allowing the extreme right to engage in campaigns of intimidation that are as targeted and potentially effective as any military psyops program. And just as street violence is necessary to ensure the credibility of the threats implied in their social media activity, so the whole infrastructure of physical and symbolic violence provides the foundation for an acceptance of, or more commonly simply indifference to, the racist, Islamophobic, and anti-Semitic positions that attract and mobilize their activist base. The effects of this strategy internationally and the nature of communications is such that its effects cannot be limited to national borders are striking indeed. Neo-fascist and racist movements have succeeded in producing an initially implicit but now increasingly explicit legitimation of ideas that only a few years ago would have been considered criminal, if not unthinkable responses to social problems, especially problems involving others, immigrants, refugees, et cetera. In fact, we are witness, witnesses to a disavowed reaction, a reactivation, sorry, disavowed reactivation of the medieval penalty of Vogelfrei imposed not on single individuals, but on entire populations set free by a refusal of sanctuary or refuge. Those fleeing war, drought, famine are left to starve, be killed or enslaved, while those who exclude them consider themselves as doing so by right, having been exempted from any responsibility for the continued existence of those strangers. Worse, for many in the global north, the abandonment of the others has become something like a moral duty, 
given the danger, whether to a nation's security or its culture, they are said to pose. The flood of refugees has become an invasion, their need for food, clothing, and shelter, a pillaging of the West, and their struggle to maintain a semblance of their customs, religions, and languages, an assault on our national cultures, if not the European Enlightenment. Moreover, for sections of the extreme right, by virtue of their numbers, the refugees have provoked a state of exception that resists any restoration of legality. What happens to them in the lawless condition they have created is thus their responsibility. Excluding the refugees who are daily arriving and leaving them to violence and destitution is thus seen as both morally right and existentially necessary. These ideas are not new ideas, they are very familiar, nor are they pale versions, the spirits lingering of the old ideas. If they differ from the genocidal dreams of the last century, so, su so successfully realized first in the colonial world and finally in Europe itself, the difference lies in the fact that their implementation, although different in different and perhaps unrecognizable forms, would be significantly easier than in the past. The ideas that we thought were gone forever live on in the material form of the mass movements whose existence is both corporeal and virtual in which they are already but incompletely incarnate or imminent. The effectivity, even the persistence of such ideas depends on the force and velocity of these movements. We cannot measure this force and velocity, however, solely by the number of adherents, the ideas of white supremacy, uh, racism, Islamophobia, et cetera, actually mobilize, whether as voters or militants. The extent of their power is most clearly displayed in the degree to which they are able to neutralize active opposition and to render their adversaries inactive and inarticulate by diminishing their capacity to think and to act. In this, they have had considerable success, uh, both in the US and elsewhere. They have extended the border of the tolerable and the plausible to include previously politically and morally intolerable ideas and arguments, whose premises, moreover, were not very long ago regarded as obviously false or uh, uh, unjust. In the US today, the acts of violence by the extreme right until very, very recently were ignored by the state, uh, tolerated by the state, and uh, overlooked typically by the media. Their campaigns of threats and intimidation were increasingly regarded as or treated, including by uh, the authorities, as constitutionally protected speech. At the same time, particularly in France today, we see the opposite, namely an extension of the realm of the intolerable to include anti-racism itself. No one today would confess to being a racist, but anti-racism, it is argued, is simply a subspecies of true racism. Anti-racism has become a moralizing blackmail whose strategic objective is to silence those who see the danger that the Islam refugees bring with them poses to the future of the West. True racism, according to these people, is the racism of the stranger the other's hatred and envy of my culture, meaning perhaps no more than his unwillingness to acknowledge the superiority of my culture over his. What passes for anti-racism or political correctness, correctness or uh, as, as uh, one says in France now, Islamo-gauchisme, Islamo-leftism, uh, Islamo is the active support of the contempt the others feel and demonstrate towards the West when they should only feel admiration and gratitude. Conversely, what anti-racists call racism or Islamophobia is in fact a legitimate defense of the secular culture against an alien invasion that threatens to turn it against itself in the name of diversity and multiculturalism. There can be no greater mistake than to believe that these ideas can be displaced let alone dispelled by different, better ideas, as if racist and fascist ideas have not been able to overcome and subdue better ideas quickly and easily without bothering with the formalities of rational argument and demonstration. They prevail because of the power exercised by the movements that embrace and inspire them, a power that allows them to exclude or expel true ideas without ever refuting them.
If we look for real arguments in the contemporary discourses of racism and neo-fascism, and this is uh, even more true when we think about the pandemic, we will not find them. At their foundation, we will find only empty cliches or outright absurdities. Their ideas advance not through their intrinsic power, but through the ability of the movements that bring them to life to paralyze critical thought and action through fear, both fear of the other, but much more importantly, fear of the power of the movements themselves. To understand the complexity of the fear that far-right movements inspire, we have to turn to Hobbes, who uses the term awe to describe the complex passion the sovereign must inspire in the people in order to be effective. For there to be peace among men who are naturally at war, there must be, quote, a common power to keep them all in awe. And awe here, of course, means fear and might reasonably be translated as terror. But it is fear of something whose power must necessarily be far greater than ours and that being greater surpasses our ability to understand it. It is fear mixed with mystery, but something like a sense of the sublimity of what we fear, that is a fear of an immensity and a level of violence that lies beyond comprehension. The feeling of awe here approaches a kind of reverence, but a reverence that does not know itself as such, an idealizing but disavowed identification with the aggressor. Thus, as racist and neo-fascist movements grow more powerful, they shift the relations of power in the different sites and forms of confrontation throughout society in their favor. And as they do so, we see uh, repeated everywhere the spectacle that Spinoza had the courage to formulate in the first person. I see the better, judge it to be the better, and pursue the worse. The process of orienting ourselves politically begins with an acknowledgement of the real relationship of forces in our conjuncture and its effects on the theory and practice of those who hope to change it. Our ideas, no matter how true, will only be as powerful as the movements that carry them forward. Thank you, that's it. Thank you, Warren. Our last talk for tonight uh, before uh, we take a short break and reconvene for Questions and answers will be Nathan Brown's with the analytic of separation. Okay, thanks so much. Um, thanks to the organizers, uh, Brendan and Alex uh, and Justin, and thanks everyone for uh, for coming tonight. Um, so a few words before I begin. Uh, what I'm going to present uh, is a. Uh, a section from the last chapter of my book, which just came out in January, uh, Rationalist Empiricism, A Theory of Speculative Critique. And the main title of that book, Rationalist Empiricism, is actually from Althusser. It's a term that he uses in passing in a 1965 essay titled uh, Theory, Theoretical Practice, Theoretical Formation. And he uses it to refer in a sort of complex way to a tradition of French epistemology of science um, that I take up and try to think through uh, in the book, particularly in the introduction. So I just wanted to say there's a few chapters on Althusser in the book, and this is the last chapter of uh, the book. So one of the things that I'm trying to do is develop um, a rationalist empiricist approach to Marx uh, via a question posed by Althusser. And so I can return to that larger context if, if people want in the Q&A. Um, so for now, I'm going to begin uh, with a quotation from Reading Capital, um, a question that Althusser poses. He writes, in Capital, we find a systematic presentation, an apodictic arrangement of concepts in the form of that type of demonstrational discourse that Marx calls analysis. What is the provenance of this analysis, which Marx must have regarded as pre-existent since he only demanded its application to political economy. We pose this question as one indispensable to an understanding of Marx and one which we are not yet in a position to give an exhaustive answer. So a few components uh, from this quotation. So first of all, Althusser is asking after the provenance of a demonstrational discourse in Marx. Um, and it's one that involves an apodictic arrangement of concepts. 
thefts. And he claims that Marx must have regarded this discourse as pre-existent since he only demanded its application to political economy, right, rather than its invention. And finally, Altisera says that he's not yet in a position to give an exhaustive answer to this question. That is to say, what's the provenance of this demonstrational discourse? And so I propose to answer this question uh, directly. Um, and I can't do so exhaustively in, in 20 minutes, um, but there's more on this uh, in, the, in the chapter that I'm drawing this from. So to get to the point, um, my answer to this question is that Marx grasps the relationship between the history and the structure of capitalism um, as what he calls a process of separation, Scheidungsprozess. And he develops grasping this from the relation between the history and the structure of capitalism, he develops an analytical method that I'll call the analytic of separation. So this mode of analysis involves a method of imminent critique. That is, the structural determinations of capital are inferred from the contradictions of its history. And then these are applied to a critical understanding of political economy, a critique of political economy. So the argument is that this mode of analysis is pre-existent insofar as it's derived from the process of separation that is the history of capitalism itself. Um, so Marx, uh, through what might be thought of as an empirical dimension of his theory, observes the history of capitalism and rationally turns this into an analytical method applied to political economy, the analytic of separation from the process of separation um, that he reads in the history of capital. Okay, so the key to grasping the concept of separation as an answer to Althusser's question and understanding its political significance is to grasp it as a displacement in Marx's mature work of the concept of alienation. So for Althusser, the centrality of alienation in the vocabulary of Marx's early works is symptomatic of his early humanist ideology. Uh, and this is partly because the logic of Entausserung, of alienation, is that of exteriorization. The alienation of human essence through the division of labor and the subsumption of production by the commodity form, the value form. In Capital, the concept of, of alienation is still used, as Althusser's critics um, have often pointed out. But it's the term Scheidung which is translated as separation or divorce, more literally, uh, that takes on a more systematic significance in Capital Volume 1, uh, signaled by the description of the division of labor as a Scheidungsprozess, and also by the use of the term in the context of primitive accumulation, and also the, the tendential separation of the nominal content of the money form from its material substrate. Um, so both of these, primitive accumulation and that separation of, of nominal content of the money form, are both described by Marx using the term Scheidungsprozess, as is the division of labor. The logic of separation is different than that of alienation, insofar as it involves the opening of a gap between elements, rather than the exteriorization of an interior. And it's this different logic that enables separation to function across different contexts in capital, in a way that wouldn't be possible for the term alienation. So it gives, uh, this concept of separation gives Marx new analytical extensions that wouldn't be possible through the logic of, of alienation. However, despite its systematic significance, the concept of separation also plays a somewhat recessed role in volume one of Capital. So there's no section of the book that's explicitly devoted to the concept uh, it doesn't appear in the table of contents, unlike so many of the other major concepts and categories in capital. Uh, and, you know, recent in introductions to capital by uh, figures like Michael Heinrich or David Harvey uh, grant the concept no major role, which would be unthinkable for terms like value or labor power or accumulation. But in fact, I want to argue that separation is an even more fundamental concept in Marx than value itself. Uh, and that it's only by understanding the history of capital as a Scheidungsprozess, as a process of separation, that we can understand the concept of value in Marx. Uh, 
This, I think, is also the key to reading Marx politically, or one of the keys, and in an Althusserian way. And that's because it's the concept of separation that allows us to grasp the integral relation between the historical and theoretical chapters of Das Kapital through a single process and a single term. Consider Marx's claim in chapter three of Capital that, quote, the division of labor converts the product of labor into a commodity and thereby makes necessary its conversion into money. I'll just read that again because it's, it's important here. The division of labor converts the product of labor into a commodity and thereby makes necessary its conversion into money. So it's the division of labor that does this. And that's in chapter three of Capital prior to the chapter on the division of labor. So we can only understand this claim retroactively after reading chapters 13 to 15 of the book on the division of labor as a process of separation, which converts the product of labor into a commodity precisely by creating what Marx calls an all around material dependency in which producers do not have access to the products of their labor except through the mediation of capitalist exchange and in which the value of commodities is determined by the measure of socially necessary labor time attendant upon the abstraction of labor power as a commodity uh, from any, and also something that has to be reproduced, from any concretely embodied instance of labor. So the value form, uh, which will subsume the production and exchange of commodities, we can say is grounded in a manifold process of separation that begins with primitive accumulation and has its nexus in the division of labor. So let me spell out um, the different uh, forms of separation that we encounter in volume one of capital. So the separation of labor from property, the separation of producer from product. So those are proper to primitive accumulation, which again, Althusser explicitly calls a Scheidungsprozess. Um, and then the internal separation of the process of production through the division of labor the separation of use value from exchange value, the separation of value from value creating activity, uh, the separation of abstract labor, labor from concrete living labor, and finally, uh, the separation of capital from labor. So through all of these, considered as a historical process of separation, combining these together, Social individuals are separated from the conditions of possibility to reproduce their lives without the mediation of commodities and money. <clears throat> the systematic import of the concept of Scheidungsprozess in the division of labor chapter uh, becomes clear if we consider that the chapters on cooperation, the division of labor and machinery and large scale industry make up the bulk of part four of capital, which is titled the production, production of relative surplus value. So this is a key point. Interestingly, it's these historical chapters describing the division of labor as a process of separation and doing so in some empirical detail that ground the concept of relative surplus value, which is at the core of Marx's whole analysis. Not only the center of the book, but I would say structurally the core of, of uh, his theoretical apparatus because it links together his structural theory with the concrete history of capitalism. It does so because it's the increasing production of relative surplus value, which is made possible by expanding surplus labor time through the division of labor and through technological innovation uh, that goes along with it, that enables the process of accumulation to overcome limits upon um, an initial contradiction, limits upon the extraction of absolute surplus value. So one can only lower wages and extend the length of the working day so much while still being able to reproduce labor power to, in a systematic way. So it's the production of relative surplus value that allows capital historically to overcome this initial contradiction, these initial limits upon accumulation. But by the same token, we can also say that uh, it's contradictions imposing limits upon the extraction of relative surplus value that will lead to the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. So this other sort of pole of Marx's theory of the history of capitalism drawn out of its structural contradictions. So that is, we might say, um, uh, 
there's a tendential separation of capital itself from the conditions of possibility for its own reproduction. It's one way that we could think about on the one hand, the production of surplus populations, on the other hand, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. So just as the division of labor is the crux of the history of capital, the crux of the transition from formal to real subsumption, uh, from the primacy of producing absolute surplus value to a tendential uh, increase in production of relative surplus value. So just as the division of labor is, is that crux of the history of capital, the concept of relative surplus value is also the, the, the crux of the theory of capitalism developed in, in volume one. So grasping the division of labor as a process of separation enables us to understand the relationship between these historical and theoretical dimensions of Marx's work through the very concept that comes to displace the humanism of alienation um, within his earlier work. So that's the Althusserian point. So the, the point is, is as follows. It's that the concept of separation is what displaces the concept of alienation. And it's this new non-humanist concept that enables Marx to suture together the historical and theoretical dimensions of his analysis in what Althusser is calling a, a mode of demonstrational discourse. And the other part of the argument is that crucially, he's gleaning this from these historical chapters, most importantly from the chapters on primitive accumulation and the chapters on the division of labor. Okay, so to review, I wanna emphasize three points. I'm realizing this is actually, I'm gonna be way under time here. Uh, for once. Um, so to review, I want to emphasize uh, three points. So first of all, Scheidungsprozess can be used to refer to primitive accumulation, the division of labor, and I'm extending it to the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, the separation of capital from its own conditions for reproduction. And these are joined at the crux of the theory of relative surplus value in part four of capital. So secondly, understanding the link between the history and structure of capital with Scheidung's process emphasizes the processual dimension of Marx's vocabulary. Okay, so many of his other key terms um, in the table of contents uh, are processual terms. So for example, the valorization process, the labor process, the process of exchange. Right, so we get Verwertungsprozess, the Arbeitsprozess. And crucially for understanding <clears throat> the movement of, of Marx's theoretical and conceptual apparatus, right, we always have to think about the valorization process in relationship to the labor process. Um, even if the valorization process comes to predominate over uh, the labor process. And I would say that it's the Scheidungsprozess of the division of labor, which is at the center of this relationship between the valorization process and the labor process, right? It's what enables capitalism to develop a valorization process or actually a, a process of labor that is adequate to uh, the necessities of its valorization process. That's relative surplus value. That's the point of the division of labor. Third point, so the second point is, is emphasizing this processual dimension of Marx's vocabulary. Um, third point, this has, I think, political consequences. So we have to understand value in Marx's theory through this relationship between the valorization process and the labor process. And it's precisely as this relation that the process of separation is situated. Focusing on it, as what I'm thinking here is the ground of value, Scheidung's process, helps us to sustain attention to the fact that capitalism is a historically contingent mode of production, that it's sustained by constantly reproducing its conditions of possibility and um, its structural dominance. So that is to say, capitalism is sustained not only by the value form, but also by power. Right, the kind of power that acts, for example, in primitive accumulation, um, even the kind of power that operates managerially in the process of production, um, and obviously the kind of power that confronts uh, militants and revolutionaries um, in revolutionary processes, or even just in processes of uh, political demonstration. Um, 
So it's, it's power that enables, as well as the formal subsumption of social relationships by the value form, the reproduction of the relations of production. So to conclude, um, by answering Althusser's theoretical and methodological question, what's the provenance of this demonstrational discourse, this form of analysis? By answering that question, we also emphasize a key political dimension of Marx's mature work, and thus of the epistemological break, the break between the humanism of, of alienation um, and the non-humanist theoretical construction of, of the later Marx. It's the concept of separation that unites historical, theoretical, and political dimensions of capital. And we can arrive at this conclusion by understanding the import of imminent critique to Marx's method. So the method of analysis that he applies to political economy is gleaned from the structural history of capitalism itself. So what he applies rationally is gleaned empirically. Uh, and that's the import of some of these historical chapters um, in, in volume one. His materialist dialectic is the process of separation, Scheidungsprozess, taken up, thought through, and united with a system of concepts enabling capital to be grasped structurally and historically at the same time in a manner that displaces the opposition of structure and genesis. So finally, we can say something like, the process of separation is the structural history of capitalism itself. And the analytic of separation is its adequate critique. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so that was the last talk of the panel. And thank you to all three of you for excellent talks. Um, is it okay with everyone if we just take a brief kind of five minute break for all, all of us to gather our thoughts for Q and A? And if anyone has questions, uh, send it to myself or any of the other hosts in the chat. Thank you. Adrian and Warren. Um, okay, we can start with that. Oh, okay. Um, so thinking about both of these papers, I mean, the the first thought I had is, is I mean, Alphazer is in some ways unjust to Gramsci, um, though he's not wrong, but is in some ways unjust. Um, in that, you know, especially thinking about like the role of the economic instance, um, as for instance, Stathis Gruvalakis has like raised in his discussions of the crisis of Marxism and stuff like that, and essays like that, um, Althusser rarely really even mentions capitalism as such, right, in talking about these crises. Um, but so thinking back to Gramsci, and just the idea of the way that a whole philosophy is always embedded in practices and the practices themselves sort of form a material substrate for their persistence over time. And so this sort of is the pivot to asking uh, to my question to Warren, which is, yeah, I, I think this idea that you know, in the present, we're sort of stumbling around in the dark, trying to find something to orient ourselves is an extremely like, it, it is an extremely helpful formulation, I think of Althusser's own approach to like the opacity of the conjuncture that we have to sort of orient ourselves in it. Um, and this is, this is sort of a comment question mess, I guess, but um, in thinking about contemporary fascisms and the problem of uh, reductionisms or the question of reductionisms um, and attempts to form a po politics against this sort of process, this fascism that is sort of persistent, um, you know, I, I, I guess like I'm, I'm sort of curious about the problem of like representing capital, right, as this sort of flattening leveling process which produces certain results on the one hand. And then on the other hand, the very real conflictual space which is set when we consider that 
the right in the United States, at least, right, sort of operates as this reserve army of white supremacy, which has like this very deeply rooted you know, armed base, which can not just like did, like set the like not just act in a way that causes terror or fear or awe, but also like set the pace of events and the 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 set the sort of system that it, it, it can create conditions to which we're constantly reacting rather than acting. So even in even in formulating our own conditions of action, these are still happening in a way that is fundamentally passive and reactive um, and behind. Um, and so, I mean, I think this, this just kind of goes back to that problem of spontaneous philosophy and the, the philosophy of the philosophy that is embedded in action, right? Whether it is thematized or not. Um, and was wondering if there's enough that's coherent in that to sort of um, respond to your papers. Um, thank you both also. Can I ask you that to now or no? <laughs> yes, please, go for it. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's something that I, I didn't talk about in this paper because I've talked about it extensively, probably repetitively elsewhere. But I think in, in no way can we conceive of a capitalism, which is not just an abstract system. It exists in very particular forms at a given moment. But now, especially, we can't conceive of it as some kind of backdrop to this play that's going on. It's not that at all. I see the far right and the, the movements, uh, for example, against the lockdown, against masks, et cetera, as, uh, and I, I don't think it's a conspiracy that uh, everybody, you know, the Proud Boys get together with uh, the Wall Street Journal and hash it out or something. But I think that there's an objective convergence of aims and that uh, the, these movements uh, are, uh, in a sense, defending and protecting the interests of capital. I mean, certainly defending their uh, profits, et cetera, uh, by, you know, with, with arguments that have nothing to do with capital directly. They're not saying, you know, we, I mean, they, they don't like socialism, but they're not claiming to support capitalism. They, they have a whole series of discourse about personal liberty and uh, COVID is a, is a hoax, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that what we've seen is that, that this is this the pandemic was a crisis for capital as well it, it threatened and you know to some extent the threat has come true like a massive transfer of wealth away from them to uh people in, in need during a pandemic and that's exactly what they didn't want they do anything to avoid and they many of them would prefer uh you know a kind of violence uh, etc to, to uh, allowing that to happen. And I, and I think that this is a perfect example of how these things are interwoven in ways that you can't even begin to separate. And, and I, I think that, I mean, in, uh, I just, my, my point is really that the, the specific nature of capitalism right now is absolutely tied to the uh, existence of these groups. I mean, if we, I mean, it's hard to project hypotheticals, et cetera. But it, it, if it were not for the existence of these groups, you know, we could imagine a very different scenario of, uh, uh, you know, uh, like a 1930s type uh, assault on capital, et cetera. And uh, that, that was, a, it's not over, I'm not saying that, but I mean, it was certainly stalled. And uh, I think that's, it's important. And, and we can't, it's hard to sort these things out right at the moment, but I, I think we can at least say that. And so those movements are completely tied to capital, wh whether intentionally or not intentionally. And, and you know, we have to recognize that. And, and I, it's not about economism or ignoring capitalism. Or something. So, yeah, but, but we have, I would just say that we don't want to see an abstract system uh, to hold on to this idea that, you know, if we don't talk about it as, as an abstract system, then uh, we're going to go astray. I don't, I, I think we have to look at the the specific, what are the threats to, to various forms of capital accumulation, et cetera. And if we don't do that, and if we don't look at neoliberal forms, 
as, as a variant of that, then we're, we'll just be lost. We'll be repeating empty abstractions and, uh, you know, strategy becomes impossible. Anyway, so. And to, uh, you know, respond, uh, uh, you know, to, especially I think, uh, you know, the earlier moments, uh, Alex, of your line of questioning, uh, you know, you began with raising doubts about the fairness of, you know, the Althusserian critique of Gramsci and, and what is to be done. Um, and as I indicated in passing uh, in, in my initial presentation, you know, I, I too would concede that there are some, you know, instances in which, you know, Althusser uh, perhaps deliberately overlooks moments where Gramsci qualifies things such that he would not be quite so guilty of, you know, the charges that uh, Althusser in this 1978 manuscript lobs at him. Um, and, you know, and I'm thinking of, you know, uh, you know, first and foremost, you know, the fact that for Gramsci, uh, when you uh, are trying to account for the persistence of elements of, of what we might just for convenience to say for now call superstructure, I mean, talking about, you know, given institutions and practices that arose in a pre-capitalist mode of production, for instance, you know, of course, Gramsci's discussions of the Roman Catholic Church in the Italian context, uh, you know, come to mind first and foremost. Um, you know, that Gramsci indicates that, um, that there is a way in which the mode of production in terms of the economic base or infrastructure does play a key role in determining which, uh, you know, of these vestiges of the past manage to transplant themselves into the new historical block uh, and integrate themselves with it and, and, and thereby persist and remain a part of the social landscape versus those that fall by the historical way, wayside by virtue of failing to be able to adapt themselves uh, to the conditions and demands of an altered mode of production in terms of a changed economic base. Um, and so, you know, you could, you could certainly mount a defense of Gramsci using those moments, but at the same time, I think that, uh, that Althusser is correct that those moments are far outweighed you know, especially given, uh, you know, Gramsci's concern with combating certain forms of, of, of classical Marxist economism. They're far outweighed by Gramsci bending the stick in the other direction and, of course, valorizing superstructure to a perhaps exaggerated extent, you know, in line with some of the other founding figures of the Western Marxist tradition in the 20s and 30s. Um, and, you know, furthermore, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's telling here that, you know, what uh, Althusser finds fault with, you know, views as a vice in the prison notebooks, shows up at the same time as a virtue, you know, in uh, interpretations such as that of, you know, for instance, the Laclauian, uh, you know, reconstruction of the theory of hegemony in, in an explicitly post-Marxist guise. And, you know, one has to bear in mind that, you know, likewise, uh, uh, Laclau, he says, well, there are these moments where Gramsci does indeed still seem to cling to the economy, you know, but, you know, rather than those being slight saving graces, as they would be from the Althusserian perspective, you know, they're residual vices to be jettisoned by, you know, a contemporary reconstruction of a more viable post-Marxist theory of hegemony. Um, and what I'm really interested in is not so much the accuracy or lack thereof in, in the interpretation of the literal text of the prison notebooks, you know, but rather the manner in which Gramsci figures in more recent and contemporary radical leftist theory and practice. Um, and in that level, I think there's a lot, you know, to, to, that's worth holding on to you know, from Althusser's critique of, of Gramsci and, and uh, what is to be done regardless of its, you know, textual accuracy as scholarly exegesis. Um, now, you know, of course, linked to that is just to put it in very simple terms, and it was perhaps so obvious I didn't bother to state it. Um, you know, certainly I think that uh, uh, reinventing not only uh, the critique of political economy in the way that I think, you know, Warren's remarks in response to you just suggested, and certainly Nathan's paper, you know, exhibits like what you know, what is to be gained by really a careful engagement with the mature Marx in terms of his critique of political economy. Um, that likewise also at the level of the practice of politics. I mean, you know, I think that in Warren's talk, um, his, you know, very nice Spinoza inspired description of how the far right it, it induces in us on the left, this this debilitation, this, imp this impeding or inhibiting of our power uh, to think act, feel, et cetera, 
uh, and, and that, uh, you know, and, and especially the arousing of certain negative affects and, you know, certain trains of thought that are, you know, effectively disempowering for us at the level of practice. I would say that, you know, Warren's very nice Spinozistic description of that for today's far right slash neo-fascism, um, I think also applies going back several decades, you know, more or less four decades to what happens to both the center and radical left uh, with the rise of neoliberalism, especially in its Thatcherite and Reagan, you know, Reagan night guises at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. And that, of course, things like, you know, the post-Marxism represented by figures such as Laclau is, of course, in my view, precisely a kind of intellectual version of that disempowerment in terms of more or less abandoning the field of the economy uh, and, you know, a, a both theoretically and practically uh, to the, to the, 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 you know, the resurgent right. Um, and, I think that we're still living with the consequences of that four decades on. Um, and I think that we have basically on the left made many grave mistakes by letting ourselves be bullied out of, uh, you know, fighting on the train of the economy and directly, you know, maintaining, insistently maintaining, you know, the always uh, political stakes of the economy, et cetera. Um, now, also related to this, um, and in connection with some of what Warren was saying in response to you, um, you know, I do think that, uh, you know, among his many bits of invaluable wisdom, uh, Benjamin's uh, priceless dictum, according to which every fascism is the index of a failed revolution, um, and if, precisely of a revolution in the more traditional Marxist sense, which would include economic, re you know, revolutionizing the economy, changing you know, the mode of production, especially relations of production, um, that, you know, this is well worth holding on to as well. And for example, in connection with some of the phenomena that, that you know, Warren is talking about, um, you know, right after the Charlottesville uh, uh, debacle, uh, you know, a few years back, you know, early on in the Trump presidency, um, you know, out of curiosity, I got online and I looked up the websites of the different far right groups that were involved in, the, you know, were played leading roles in the Unite the Right rally. Um, and, you know, one thing that just jumped out at me from, you know, everything from the, you know, the opening, you know, the, the, the home web page of the American Nazi Party to, you know, similar outfits, is that there is something to, you know, this Benjaminian dictum, and that, you you know, a lot of the complaints, you know, do involve, I mean, it's a sense of the left is basically implicitly without saying as much, indicate that, you know, leftist elites of a central leftist type have abandoned us to global capitalism, has left us to the depredations of all of this. Um, nobody's going to save us. But then, of course, all of this, you know, in line with good old national socialism, you know, necessarily then bringing in the racializing, perverting twist to all of this. Um, but, you know, there is a sense in which, you know, it, you, know you could have, have as a, as a compliment to Benjamin here, um, that, you know, so, you know, not only is every fascism the index of a failed revolution, so long as we continue to fail to struggle to revolutionize the economy, you know, the specter of these kinds of fascisms will remain with us. Um, and I think a lot of what I saw on those websites, you know, gave me a sense of the, the real validity to this. I mean, I spared myself the pain of actually talking to neo-fascists, but, you know, the internet was enough of a buffer that I could bring myself to look at this material. Um, now, you know, in terms of, uh, I think I, I suspect there's something that I'm not speaking to involved in your line of questioning, some which might have been intended for me, but I'm not sure. Um, but, uh, you know, hopefully that, that that helps. Oh, one other thing I should say is, is that, you know, in my view, too, one of the lessons of the past four decades of neoliberalism, of which I see, you know, Trump, you know, neo-fascism, et cetera, as, as bound up with, um, I do think that, you know, I mean, this kind of capitalism is very open. It's not, it doesn't hide this. It's very open that it is all about basically leveling everything down to marketplace style relations where, you know, everything from family life to, you know, how you think of political leadership is to be modeled on the marketplace, on commodities, on, you know, how individuals interact within this particular sphere of civil society. Um, it is overtly, explicitly reductive. Um, and that I think that it is true to its word. Um, and, you know, in the way that Trump is also so inadvertently, you know, honest at moments, um, that it really follows through on this. And that, you know, if you really want to understand why our reality is the way it is, you have to understand contemporary capitalist forms of the pursuit of surplus value in the guises of, uh, you know, profit, interest, rent, et cetera. And that without understanding this, I don't think you can actually accurately cognitively map the, the contemporary situation and corresponding to that properly intervene 
with respect to it. But there's more I'm sure that could be said, but I'll just stop right there since I imagine there are other questions. Thank you. Um, I guess in the interest of time, um, I might do something a little unorthodox just in case of um, overlaps across resonances and have two people ask a question and then an answer. Um, so Asad, then Daniel, would you like to ask your questions? Okay. So um, a little further along these lines, I think uh, I feel that we need to push this a lot further. Um, I, I, let me get at the general questions through some uh, specific ones. Adrian, you gave us this juxtaposition uh, between Gramsci and Lukács, which, which is very interesting and, and uh, very relevant. Of course, when, uh, you know, Althusser makes very favorable references to Gramsci in the early 60s writings. Uh, and as you point out, there are criti there's criticisms in reading Capital, then there, there are these criticisms in the late 70s, not just in what is to be done, but in other unpublished texts and so on. Um, so it's, first of all, it's interesting to ask what changed um, between the early 60s and the late 70s. Second, uh, th this juxtaposition between Lukács and Gramsci is explicitly raised uh, in uh, 1962, when uh, Althusser says, uh, the only person who ever really addressed these problems in Marxism was Gramsci. And then in, in the footnote, he says, you know, uh, Lukács is an example of a total failure to do this. Uh, Lukács uh, simply has a framework which is completely unacceptable and, uh, the, in, in, and, and consistently, he, he never says anything positive about Lukács. He says, you know, the, he says the fashionable theory of reification is like, uh, it's a complete uh, uh, failure to understand Marx's critique of political economy. So the idea of returning to the critique of political economy, this is very abstract, I think, because there are different critiques of political economy. And Nathan, I think, gave a very rigorous account of what we would get from following through on Althusser's indications and actually interpreting Marx's critique of political economy, that is impossible from the standpoint of reification. And uh, that all of these, uh, this analysis of primitive accumulation, the analysis, the historical analysis of the division of labor, you cannot get that through the philosophy of history, which is reification. And uh, so, I, I mean, I think this is very important. We have to distinguish between different kinds of critiques of political economy, different conceptions of the economic. And we, uh, if we just call for a return to thinking about the economic, we may end up with a bad theory. And we, that, that, I don't see how that's more helpful than uh, abandoning the economy. Well, uh, let me, uh, are you, uh, okay, go ahead. Another, another I, I raised this, what, what accounts for the change between the early 60s and the late 70s? Early 60s, uh, we, we are dealing with the theory of the PCF of state monopoly capitalism. They have presented an economic theory, uh, which uh, is a justification for the reformist program of the party. And that is, uh, it's a completely economic theory. Uh, that is based in uh, an analysis of the current stage of the capitalist mode of production. It's in the late 70s that Euro communism begins to elaborate this kind of program uh, with reference to the superstructure and drawing on uh, Gramsci's theories. And so this uh, changes the strategic outlook. And I think what is, what is actually distinctive in Gramsci's work that Althusser finds valuable in the early 60s? I don't think it's an account of the superstructure. I think what it is, the superstructure is relevant insofar as it's an object of strategy, because in contradiction over determination, he is not presenting a theory of the relation between base and superstructure, which later he will say is purely descriptive and heuristic. He's presenting an account of the conjuncture, political intervention, and strategy. And so strategy changes in these circumstances. And you could say, that the critique of Gramsci, insofar as Gramsci was taken up by Eurocommunism in the late 70s, is a strategic maneuver. And it's, it's a very Gramscian maneuver in this sense. The critique of Gramsci itself is, 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 is a move along the lines of Gramsci criticizing Bukharin and, and all the rest. Because Gramsci ultimately he is not a sociologist. Gramsci is a revolutionary insurrectionist 
he was concerned with strategy. And Althusserra is also that. And so strategy is his concern. And I think uh, this is um, this uh, can get uh, obscured by just referring abstractly to the critique of political economy. I'll stop there. Right. For, for a long question, you're going to find my answer unsatisfactorily short. But, you know, really, in a way, a lot of what you say by way of criticizing me jumps to too many conclusions. So let me begin by saying I don't actually fully endorse the young Lukacs' 1920, circa 1923 account of reification. In fact, I agree with much of his post-1923 self-criticism about the shortcomings of that notion. What I wanted to get out of reference specifically to that moment in history and class consciousness as itself one of the founding documents of the tradition Merleau-Ponty comes to baptize Western Marxism is that nonetheless contained within it is this registration at the very foundations of Western Marxism with its tendency towards wanting to argue against economism and to endorse a robustly anti-reductive version of historical materialism that nonetheless contained within one of the key texts for that sort of approach or orientation that plays such a large role in 20th century European Marxism um, is this acknowledgement that, well, wait a minute, there is this fashion in which when we account for the superstructure, if we do so with an eye to the manner in which specifically the commodity form, as for Marx himself, starting in volume one of Capital, as the core load-bearing, uh, you, you might say, condensed nucleus of capitalism, um, that this form colonizes, right, permeates, um, remakes in its own image a full sweep of things up to and including, I mean, Lukács goes so far as to give examples of, right, our very own inner experience of self-consciousness, temporality, et cetera, on just a descriptive phenomenological level, getting massively affected, reworked by the manner in which the commodity form and all of the social relations bound up with it um, remakes us as subjects of capitalism. Um, and so there's an acknowledgement there of, on the one hand, the great import of the economy and its, the extent of its influence permeating into the nooks and crannies of what we would take to be perhaps most far removed from the directly economic. On the other hand, coupled with, along with a lot of the young Lukács' fellow travelers and followers, this also at the same time anti-reductive uh, uh, you know, opposition to economism, um, and you know, and in a way, in tension with this, a kind of resistance to wanting to acknowledge just how thoroughly capitalist the capitalist mode of production permeates even those domains we would want to consider to be non or more than economic. Um, now, for me, the the Lukacs who I'm more favorably invoking as in, you know, basically having similar reservations that. Althusser at certain moments, such as in Café, has vis-a-vis -vis a certain aspect of Gramsci. That's the later Lukács. And moreover, I don't think the evidence that I've seen from Althusser's corpus doesn't indicate an intimate familiarity with the later Lukács. And so the criticisms of, you know, whether from Lukács himself when he became self-critical post-1923 or from Althusser being critical of Lukács, I fully grant that. Right, I don't think that you know early Lukacian reification by itself is is at all adequate, but I think that there's some there's some interesting implications to it in terms of its placement there in this text that plays this role in the history of of post Lukacian and post Gramscian Western Marxism. Um, now, as for you know the issue too of what you call strategy, um, you know, of course strategy implies something very long term, and you know one might want to you know, think of this sometimes in terms of the more nimbler, shorter term you know, movement of tactics. But whether we think about it as strategy or tactics, um, you know, certainly yes. I mean, the Euro-communism issue, as well as you know, certain other developments, indeed play a role. And I agree with the explanation of, well, why is it that uh, you know, Althusser becomes so pointedly critical of Gramsci at certain moments. However, at the same time, I think that one could also say that there are things that you know, Althusser clearly feels that he can extract from Gramsci in an approving, endorsing way, while still being equally vehement in his criticism of Gramsci's excesses in terms of combating economism, whether we think about that as something merely conjunctural or as a more permanent feature of their theoretical frameworks. And that for Althusser, when he's, for instance, in the longer manuscript that the ISA's essay is extracted from, the manuscript on, on the reproduction of capitalism. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a praising footnote 
uh, apropos Gramsci, right? But at the same time, I mean, it's very clear that the way that Althusser, I think, is able to, on the one hand, praise a certain Gramsci while, I think, also being vehemently critical of him in contexts such as what I focused on, is that Althusser then has this way of treating it within the mode of production, the relations of production as the intra-infrastructural pineal gland that then you know, provides the binding, as it were, between you know, the uh, dimensions of infrastructure and superstructure. And that Althusser's treatment of it in that, uh, in, in that way, I think for him, is providing a degree of specification to how these interact that would allow him to take on board certain things from a figure like Gramsci, but at the same time to insist on, with greater specificity, um, an analysis of the manner in which it's at certain sites within the economic framework that you will see these things soldered together in particular fashions. Um, and, you know, that, I mean, more or less, I would just say, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not in the business of defending the young Lukacs theory of reification in any orthodox form. Um, I don't think Althusser was a particularly astute reader of the later Lukacs, whatever his criticisms of history and class consciousness. Um, and yeah, a lot of the rest, I think, is taken care of by that. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Okay, thank you. That was a. This is very exhilarating. I want to congratulate everyone involved with this wonderful program. Um, two things quickly for Warren: Would you consider Trump a Bonapartist? Lo Cerdo, the Italian Marxist, the late Italian Marxist, makes a beautiful distinction between hard Bonapartism and soft uh, Bonapartism. And I wonder if you think that the current conjecture. Of, of Trumpism uh, falls under hard or soft. And then for Nathan, thank you for this sort of wonderful um, invocation of a very speculative and very precise um, paper. You, you use the term suture when talking about anti-humanism um, in Althusser. Could you say a little more about that? Uh, just in general, could you elaborate a little bit more on precisely how you're using that concept? I think I know, but I wanted a little clarification. Uh, should I start with the answer or what? Go ahead, Warren, yeah. Well, <laughs> um, despite the fact that I come out of the Trotskyist uh, tradition, I, I'm, I've never, I've always found the idea of the of Bonapartism uh, in the way that Trotsky uses it and other people on the left, I, I've never been exactly satisfied with it. I, I understand that, again, it's another one of these concepts that uh, you have to use in the absence of something better. But uh, I think the, the, the well, the, the, trying to base things on a, a early 19th century experience that in many ways is quite different as a model of authoritarianism. I, I'm not that, I, I would just add that to the other list of uh, sort of, <laughs> of concepts that you could throw around. It's not that common these days. I mean, uh, but uh, I, I'm not uh, I'm, I'm not at all uh, committed to that that concept, so I can't. I, I don't think it helps us really. Um, well, here my answer is is pretty simple. I mean, I'm not I wasn't using the term suture in a technical sense at all. Uh, in fact, I can't remember exactly how I used it. I suppose I was saying something like that it sutures together. The, the historical and theoretical dimensions of the analysis, but I'm not using that in like the mode of Jacqueline Miller or something like that. I'm just using it as a, to mean conjoins, but, I, but it gets at the point that, um, you know, insofar as Althusser raises this question, you know, where does this mode of demonstrational discourse come from that he calls analysis, if, it, if he regards it as pre-existent, he doesn't have to give a theory of it. You know, then that if we answer that question through the concept of separation, if we call it the analytic of separation and say that it's derived from um, the observation, let's say, of um, a process of separation operating different, you know, levels of uh, the history of subsumption, then what's important about that, I think, is that it it implies that there's already you know, that, that history and structure can't be separated in the first instance. So that is to say, they're already bound together, you know, and so Marx's empiricism, obviously Marx, you know, Althusser doesn't want to say that Marx is an empiricist in the way that he criticizes, but if we want to say that he's a rationalist empiricist, 
It's because he brings, you know, on the one hand, the development of his theoretical concepts is derived from a, from a lucid observation, you know, of something like a process of separation that then requires certain, you know, social relations and certain modes of production to, or certain um, relations of production to overcome the contradictions that accumulation encounters. So it's a way of thinking that, you know, observes empirically through a rational lens that already thinks the way in which structure and history are, are you know, bound together in the first instance. So I think that's the, you know, Althusser is right to point to this as a kind of riddle. And Althusser also gives us the tools to be able to think of why history and structure are bound together in that way. Could I just add something very quickly here? Because it's it's an interesting coincidence, but you know, with the with the Malarian conception of suture, um, you know, one thing that I discovered recently in a bit of work I was doing on this book I'm trying to finish, um, and, and this text I posted on my academia.edu website, it's it's just entitled uh, I'm nothing but I make everything, Marx, Lacan, and the labor theory of suture, is that you know, inter and there's an interesting for me cross resonance with what Nathan is doing with the idea of Scheidung in Marx, and that when you look at the various roles that things like dispossession, expropriation, you know, we could also include things like the de-skilling of labor, et cetera, you know, all of these operations, which involve in a certain sense, I mean, Marx himself uses this language, you know, making it such that workers become nothing, like I am nothing, but I should be everything, you know, you know it's the famous cry, you know, that we come across early on in Marx's corpus. Um, and that maybe there's a way with the help of someone like Miller, you could take this more literally than perhaps even Marx intended. And I think what Nathan is talking about under the heading of Scheidung really gets at this as well, which is that, you know, there has to be this operation of separation that then reduces, you know, labor to this status of zero in several senses, and of zero precisely as generative of all values that come after it, in the same way that, of course, with uh, Miller's formal rendition of Lacan via Frege, you know, you get the idea of, you know, primal repression constituting that you know that inaccessible void of the unconscious and that the subject to the unconscious thereafter is generative as the subject of enunciation of all of the you know positive whole integers is the equivalence of the utterances produced by the subject of utterance to use Lacan's like you um, that there's this way in which you could think of the operation of separation producing this voided being, you know, that is the de-skilled laborer with nothing but his hide to sell for a tanning on the marketplace of the labor market. Um, and you, there's some interesting structural parallels with then, weirdly enough, what Miller does with Frege vis-a-vis -vis Lacan. Anyhow, I'll stop, I'll stop there, but it just occurred to me uh, in connection, especially with Nathan's uh, presentation. Uh, Brandon, can I make one quick comment? Sure. I, uh, for Nathan, um, I, I wanted to, to, the thing that I was thinking about when, when you were speaking was the difference between um, Scheidung and Trennung, uh, which is a very, the, the Trennung is, is very, well, it, it, it's quite common in Marx, but maybe, a, well, it's also very, I, it makes me think of Hegel. Uh, because at certain decisive moments, that's the verb that it comes in the the splitting into contradiction. Sort of thing. But what what was interesting, and and uh, Adrian's uh, comments made me think of this as well. The difference between them, I mean, they both mean uh, division, separation, etc. But the difference between them is a very subtle one. But but it's it's also quite interesting. The Scheidung also means defecation. And defecation is interesting because it is the externalization of something, but it's the externalization of something that is in us, but is somehow foreign to us and must be uh, you know, made uh, external. And, and I think there, there is something, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but, but there is something I think in that there's a distinction because it, you can also talk about extraction. The, the Scheidung also means extraction is taking something uh, out. And, and I think that that's an element, but, but not something that originally belongs to the worker or et cetera, but something that is always already uh, foreign, other, et cetera. And, and I think that, uh, I, I was just thinking about that in relation to, to your argument, which I agree with, your argument is right. Yeah, I mean, the Trenung uh, reference is very helpful because it is, it's a key, category for Hegel, key concept for Hegel. 
And I would just say that uh, there's this very important passage in the Grindrissa, in the Grindrissa where um, you know Marx is using both of those terms just with a comma between them. You know, so uh, it's um, it's translated as this absolute divorce separation. So there, Trena is is translated as separation, and Scheidung is separated uh, translated as divorce. And in this long sentence, it's about you know 15 lines long in the Grandrissa, he's also constantly using the concept of alienation. Right. You can see in that passage the genesis of this terminological problem, where alienation, you know, trenum and scheidung are all uh, linked together, and Marx clearly has not yet sorted out how to think about that nexus of terms. What, what I think is very important in volume one of Capital is that we get the reoccurrence of this term scheidung's process, mm -hmm. which then links it with the processual vocabulary of labor process, valorization process, exchange process. And this is the signal that there's something more technical going on here. But what's important about it is that, you know, at least in the English translations, if we're reading Marx in English, this constantly gets um, embroiled because sometimes it's not translated as process of separation, that's just left out. And so one has to go to the German and one has to be very careful about um, how it's operating. Also, there's a key passage that appears in the first two editions of Capital and not the third, in which he uses Scheidung's process to refer actually to what he calls um, this double-sided process that uh, is a great passage. He says that it um, encompasses the entire development, the entire developmental history of modern bourgeois society, Scheidung's process. And then this disappears you know, from the third edition and goes untranslated in the penguin that you know everybody uses. Thank you. Um, next question is David McInnerys. Oh, Brendan, can I, I, unfortunately I have to bow out. It's a little past 7.30 my time. So alas, I have to leave. I would like to just thank everybody for a wonderful evening of discussion. And I'm really sorry I have to check out uh, prematurely. Thank you so much. Thank everybody. you, Adrian. All right, take care everyone. Okay, I hope this is working. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I, I, it's great to see my old friend Warren. I don't get to see him very often. I'm in Australia here and I missed the first two, two uh, sessions. So I apologize to those people I was in bed. Um, it's currently Tuesday lunchtime. So um, yeah, I uh, had my questions for Nathan. I really found his your talk very interesting and uh, it's on regarding separation and um, I, I was sort of thinking about how that ties in this is, you see in Althusser's work in particular how um, this question of the relationship between what is seen by many people for example E.P. Thompson as the theoretical sections of the text versus the historical sections of Marx's text and how Althusser sort of changes his position on this uh, constantly from the, through the 60s, through the early 70s and the late 70s and the 80s. You see this shift and almost this um, movement towards almost Thompson's position at some points, which is quite strange. Um, but it reflects, I think, a difficulty in keeping these aspects of Marx and, and this question of separation, which I think you've, you've sort of very nicely tuned in on, um, to actually keep them together in your head at the same time and think about um, the relationship between theory and concrete historical analysis, as opposed to the kind of empiricist abstraction that you see in, in people like Thompson, quite frankly who um, that gives a lot of description a lot and kind of colors things with theory rather than um, developing concepts that would enable a more concrete analysis of history quite often. So you get a lot of very interesting stuff in there, but it doesn't really use Marxism to think about it. So I was kind of interested in, in this question that you see in, uh, you know, like Machiavelli and us, the different ones, where you, you get this, the question of the origin of capitalism, right? The, 
the moment at which things are in flux and, we, and how they take hold. And, and I was thinking about that in relation to this question of separation. And I was thinking about it in terms of like processes that Marx would have seen around him, like Ireland at the time, you know, uh, people being forcibly separated in a very real sense, but also the, the fact that capitalism is continually separation. It is always separation. It is separation out of one, one process and then into another and then circulating in very material ways. And, and how Marx is able to, to think this. Um, and the other thing I was thinking of was how this ties in with other quote unquote non-Marxist thinkers of the era as well, specifically Deleuze and Guattari. And Deleuze and Guattari, what they pick up on from Althusser and Balaba and from Marxism and how it ties in with the question of the use of the molar, the molecular and lines of flight and how those relate to the process of taking hold and, and the sort of constituent elements that then take on another purpose. And this, this um, is very much part of the historical analysis. And I really want to thank you for bringing this up. And I wonder if you had any more to say about this kind of interaction between um, perhaps, you know, Althusser and Deleuze and Guattari in, in terms of thinking about the whole process of capitalism. Um, thanks so much. Uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot going on there. Um, yeah, sorry about that. No, that's fine. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, the question with relation to Thompson, let's say, so and, and Althusser's polemic against the kind of vulgar materialism, which is so constitutive, particularly of his of his early positions in reading Capital. I mean, you know, this is why I got interested in trying to actually theorize his uses, his usage of this term rationalist empiricism, which is quite odd in this 65 essay. Uh, and to think it through in relationship to people like Bachelard in particular, you know, because um, uh, we shouldn't think that, um, you know, obviously Marx is observing the history of capitalism better, let's say, than the political economists that he's criticizing. Why is he able to do that? Well, partly because um, partly because he develops a system of concepts adequate to doing so. But the question that Althusser is posing is like, well, where does that, how is he able to do that? And I think that has to do partly with his acuity as an observer and researcher. Um, and that's the import of these extremely long, you know, historical chapters in, in volume one of Capital that are sort of left aside too often. And the question is how to hold those together with Althusser's critique of vulgar empiricism. And I think that the term rationalist empiricism gives us a kind of answer to that question if we think about it in relation to someone like Bachelard. So everyone th thinks, you know, uh, Bachelard is like a rationalist theoretician of science, but in fact, Bachelard constantly emphasizes that there has to be an epistemological polarity a movement back and forth, a dialectic of the rational and the empirical experimentation and formalization. And so in fact, he says, you know, there's a rationalism and empiricism are joined by a strange bond as strong as that which joins pleasure and pain. That's Bachelard. And, um, and so the whole problem for him is, is how does the movement of science go from uh, experimental observation to mathematical formalization? And then on the basis of that mathematical formalization, develop new modes of constrained observation that are sort of adequate to testing those formalizations. And I think that Marx, you know, partly by the privilege of his position coming after so much, you know, so many brilliant people doing political economy, but getting it wrong, you know, he's able then to observe from the position of incorrect theoretical formations, you know, and, uh, and produce a mode of observation which gives him the capacity to, to produce new concepts that are systematically articulated. Um, about the question of uh, separation, you know, capitalism is, is, is a process of separation, but it's also one that, because it's a process of separation, develops a system of all around material dependency. It's what one, you know, might call unity and separation. You know, that would be like the way of thinking about um, the social structure of capitalism. And so one has to think the way in which um, separation is related to unity. And I think this is a key way of actually addressing a problem with Althusser uh, that Warren takes up in his great chapter on Machere and Althusser between Spinozas, uh, 
where the whole question is like, you know, why totality? What's the problem of totality in Althusser in relationship to lack and the conjuncture? This is a question that Mashere poses. And the key thing I think about the, the analytic of separation is that the category of separation is unreifiable, unlike value. Of course, we're supposed to think about value as a system of social relations, not as a thing. But one can sort of like get it wrong or think of it as a form in a way that like, you know, it, 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 become, it is reifiable, whereas separation has to be thought of as nothing, you know, and as processual, as something that happens. And so I think that it's very much um, compatible with the later Althusser of the, uh, you know, materialism of the encounter work. Uh, finally, about Deleuze, I mean, I don't know what to say. I mean, uh, you know, I think that Althusser admires Deleuze in certain ways because of Spinozism. Um, I don't, I haven't thought through the capitalism and schizophrenia books, you know, in a very long time. Uh, and I don't have much to say about the relationship between those, but, you know, deterritorialization. I mean, I guess I would say that one thing which is um, implicit in the, the notion of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall is that historically, speculatively, Marx, you know, gives a structural analysis of why capitalism tendentially, you know, becomes separated from its own conditions of possibility for, for accumulation. Now, obviously, that doesn't just like happen in a way that's final. Um, but there's a tendential process there, which is sort of like the reverse of the process of subsumption. And that, you know, comes out of uh, the um, the sort of result of the process of real subsumption. And so that's, it's, and so that kind of like, that's not deterritorialization, but there's a kind of unlinking, you know, of um, the core of the history of capitalism, which is the period of, you know, robust accumulation um, that's attendant upon the sort of massive growth of relative surplus value. And we are, in fact, you know, we are at, we live in the wake of that now. Um, and these are structural determinations of the history of capitalism that one has to keep in mind. But I'm not sure that Deleuze is yeah. the way to do it. The other thing that was interesting there about in your response was that uh, with regard to Deleuze is that Deleuze brings up rational empiricism as like one of his big things. He uses them in a very atypical sense in which we perhaps wouldn't recognize <laughs> you know, them as rationalism or empiricism, but you know, it's a kind of a he's grappling with that problem there as well, trying to think through that exactly those, those traditions and processes that you've been talking about. I mean, just a brief comment, you know, I would say that the, the chapter in Difference and Repetition on the image of thought and the theory of the encounter that you get in Deleuze there is, would be the key place to, to think about the relationship between, between those two. Thank you. Uh, okay, next question is Robbins. Um, thanks to all of the panelists and thanks to the organizers. It's been a great day. Um, I have a question for Professor Montag. I found your paper just um, exhilarating and wonderful in, in so many ways. And um, you raised so many important issues. And uh, one thing I think you, um, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm compelled by your insistence that we take the right seriously and that we don't do what I think has um, become at least one version of an argument on the left, which is um, treat uh, these right-wing mobilizations as kind of epiphenomenal to neoliberalism or, um, and, and I think you're kind of inviting uh, us to think about these mobilizations in their uh, kind of direct uh, links to uh, contemporary crises and capitalism, and I'm compelled by that. I guess I have a sort of big, like a, a, a sort of big question and then a small and, and very specific question. So you said that, um, you know, the right, the far right is not making um, sort of arguments on the level of ideas, and I'm, I'm absolutely compelled by that. And so I guess very simply sort of what do you think they are offering, if not ideas? And, and is it, is it a sort of affective formation more, more than a, a kind of ideological formation and what are its dominant affects? I got a sense that it was a sort of affective formation, the reference to Hobbes, and yet I wasn't quite sure if, um, if the sort of Hobbesian account of all was, was quite working as an account of mobilization. Um, 
but rather working as a kind of fascist imaginary of the state. And so I was kind of trying to think about um, the affective, the, the place of affects in both uh, mobilization, um, you know, and uh, perhaps a deployment of state power. And then that may, maybe brings me to the second question, which was provoked by what you said about um, maybe, although things that remain to be seen, the sort of stalling of, of this movement. And, um, and in this regard, I, I guess I would invite you to say more about um, uh, what you see as the significance of uh, the attack on the Capitol and the representation of the Capitol riots, because it, at least my own sense um, is that is, is that it represented a, a very um, kind of short-term uh, defeat for the right, but my worry is that it was a kind of long-term victory, um, and that um, and that the the, the it, some of the images that we saw on that day and the kind of affective stirrings and circulations that those images were bound um, to animate for decades and even you know, if we last that long centuries to come, I, I just felt like we uh, that this, this sort of short term analyses of uh, on the left and the sort of liberal left on that day were not something about them remained not totally satisfying to me. And so I'm wondering, uh, maybe those two questions are two versions of the same, you know, sort of one on the level of the the big general question and the other on the level of um, it's uh, kind of specific expression and representation, but um, I, I guess that's where my uh, thinking is inspired by your talk. Yeah, thank you. I, I yeah, I, I agree very much with what you said. First of all, I think the attack on the Capitol, well, it's a complicated thing. I don't think to, to underestimate the right uh, because the individuals involved are stupid and many of them are incredibly stupid. But there's a kind of collective intelligence that, that uh, probably guides them in certain ways. And I think uh, this was, if we think about military uh, terminology, this, this was a kind of test or a probe of many different aspects of how the state would react to them. And what we've seen, what it revealed, among other things, is the enormous uh, support that the far right enjoys in the army, among the police. Uh, and and you know, what we saw was the tip of the iceberg. Because if you go into rural areas, I mean, basically they have the run of the, of the cities and the towns. And uh, no one's going to stop them or put them in jail or counter their violence. And they, there's a tremendous, I, I think they are a point of attraction for angry uh, police who feel that they're being de devalued and accused of all kinds of things. And also for military who are, well, uh, people who combat veterans, et cetera. And, and I think it's an extremely dangerous uh, combination. And I think that what they did, I mean, yes, it was a defeat. Any, any probe or test is going to be a defeat, quote unquote. Uh, you're going to have to run away. People are going to shoot at you, which didn't even happen to them. But they, they, they determined the extent to which they have support and the, the, that the forces supposed to guard the state against them are not going to be uh, very formidable enemies to them. And I, I don't think that's changed. I think it's absolutely the case. And now they have a base in Congress itself. It's not, they're not weaker. They're much stronger than they were before, whatever we want to think. And Trump could, you know, is not the end of the story. So yes, I think that's right. Now, uh, do they have ideas? And this is where I would say, we have to be very careful. We have to be somewhat empirical about this. It's not, I, I don't accept that it is primarily a white working class movement. And I think that a number of uh, investigations of the people who showed up in Washington, and that may not be, you know, it's not exactly a representation because you had to be able to afford to go there, et cetera, even if there were, there was help and what have you. But I think many people, they're older white men, they're not young for the most part, 
they're white men in their 30s. I think the average age was close to 40. And these are people who are, you know, in a very classical sense, <laughs> petty bourgeois, the old terminology. They're small business owners, contractors, uh, people who sort of live uh, by commerce in some way, but they're not workers in the, in the general sense. M most of them, or many of them. And I think the weight uh, of that movement is exactly petty bourgeois. That is the dream of owning your own business, being independent, blah, blah, blah. And their, their complaints are typical of uh, small business owners. I don't want regulation. I don't want taxes, which explains why they don't care about health insurance, but they care about being free to run their business. So I think uh, we have to keep that in mind. And, and I think that the ideas, if there are ideas, they, of course they have ideas, but the ideas are not those likely to, to attract a, a lot of other people outside of that world exactly. And their ideas of having lost uh, what, what they can't say is basically white supremacy that was uncontested. They're afraid of uh, hearing other languages spoken in the street, the, the kinds of things that we've seen erupt into fights and uh, all sorts of things. And, and I think that it, 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 they're mobilized around a nostalgia for something that didn't exist, but they believe it did. And I think it's a defense of the, of the relatively small privileges that they have over uh, working class people of color. And, uh, you know, I think it's that, but, but really I think the, the power that they wield is like a magnet and it also is a cohesive force that keeps them, that, that brings them together despite all their divisions, et cetera, and allows them to influence other people. It becomes a force of attraction. And not because the ideas are anything other than some images and things like that. Uh, and it's, that's what makes it particularly frightening to me. Anyway. I just want to add, I just want to add one thing. I mean, I, I pretty much agree with uh, everything that, that Warren just said. I mean, I think that the one like idea, mm -hmm. which is an economic idea that mm -hmm. the right, that is very central to the right is, um, is globalism. Yeah. So, and to give a conjunctural analysis of it, you know, what's so interesting about it is that what's happened is that the right has simply taken over the critique of, of globalization from the left, which has in fact abandoned it. And, and that's not to say that the solution is for the, for the left to, to take up once more the, the anti-globalization movement, because it's a real contradiction. We can see, for example, in the sequence with Syriza, Mm -hmm. that the total inability to even like make a move towards seceding from the EU means that it's impossible, in fact, for the left to make a valid argument. And this is also confronts the impasses of like Lexit in, uh, in Britain, where we can see that there are very good reasons to like hate the EU and reject the EU, yet the Lexit position doesn't really hold together either. We can see that there's a real problem here, but the right doesn't need to be coherent. And right. so it's just Opted the critique of globalization, and there's a real emotional force to that, which is petit bourgeois, um, which is totally in contradiction with other priorities, but it's very powerful because um, you know that was the core of uh, you know the sort of like combination of different elements of the left from anarchists to like you know the anti-globalization movement up to 2008, and it's just been it's just been taken up, you know, and it and it has a real cohesive force, even if it's incoherent. I agree. I agree. Thank you so much. Uh, at this point, um, I said this to you in the chat, we have four questions in the queue. Uh, how are you two doing in terms of time for the evening? <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, so Nicholas, I think you have the next question. Uh, hi, uh, I guess this question is for Warren. Uh, and you, you mentioned uh, a couple times and elaborated on um, the necessary or the, the function that has emerged of uh, this uh, new right wing uh, movement um, that is now centered around uh, the petty bourgeois. Um, I, I have, I get, and this is kind of connected, I guess, to what uh, Adrian was talking about earlier uh, and what I wanted to bring up was why does Althusser critique Gramsci the way that he does? Uh, which is, he says basically that uh, 
he is Hegelian in the sense of viewing the state uh, as a teacher. Um, and that this is a way that uh, it controls thought is by teaching people directly. And that in contrast, I would say that Althusser has presented us a more uh, subtle and comprehensive theory of ideology that has that shows how it is structural uh, in nature. Um, and that this gives us, I don't think Althusser does this directly, but he gives us the tools to um, show how the critics of a system, not they may not be critiquing capitalism itself, but critiquing uh, the state and um, whatever regulatory framework it has, um, how that critique can be subsumed into that system, like that, that even that the system needs that critique in order to get new ideological frameworks um, to, to study itself. Um, and I wonder if you could comment on like that, like how, like the the new alt-right, they people called them like Neo-Gramskians basically. Um, and how did they go from a uh, small, um, like basically a young male Lumen Prol online to this group that actually has power, the petty bourgeois. Um, and how does that, uh, how does Althusser's uh, theory versus Gromsky's uh, incorporate critics of capital, of not necessarily capitalism, but of the system um, into like the structural framework of producing ideology? Yeah, that's a, it's something that I, I was thinking about uh, when Adrian was talking as well. The, I, I think one of the, the, the issues that's going on is that uh, Althusser's view of Gramsci, as was said by uh, Assad, uh, is really less about Gramsci per se, because there, there are different Gramsci's for Althusser, and there's one who never gets, has not been brought up in this discussion, which is the Gramsci who wrote The Modern Prince, and not just the sections on the, from the prison notebooks that everybody talks about. And that, that Gramsci of The Modern Prince, who is thinking uh, about strategy, that was the Gramsci that Althusser in some ways secretly treasured and, and uh, you know, because he, he saw, well, in 1962, when he first started writing about Gramsci is when he first discovered Machiavelli. I mean, really discovered Machiavelli. And it's in his letters and all this. So uh, I, I think that, that the Gramsci he's attacking, Assad is absolutely right. It, it's the Gramsci of the right wing of the Italian Communist Party in the early 60s and then Euro communism later. And Euro communism is complicated because uh, Santiago Carrillo, for example, in Spain, who is one of the leading lights, he linked Gramsci and Althusser as, uh, you know, sort of their their spiritual forefathers or something for Eurocommunism, which horrified Althusser. He was uh, very upset. So uh, I think, and, and there's, there's another figure uh, we shouldn't neglect either, 1976, Perry Anderson on the antinomies of, of Antonio Gramsci. And, and I think that, that, even though he was trying to be very critical of Eurocommunism in certain ways and linking it to the gradualism of the Second International, it was in, in other ways he pushed Gramsci even further to the right uh, in a sense that Althusser picked up on. And to answer your question in a way, it, it, the, the opposition that becomes so important for Gramsci of the state and civil society, okay, and the, the idea that the state uh, is a place of coercion and violence and civil society, uh, in Anderson's reading, it doesn't really have violence in any significant way. And it's, it, it, it can be seen as a place of freedom, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this model of state and civil society, which was not, not because of Anderson, I'm not <laughs> blaming him for everything, but the, uh, there was a tendency to take that model and make it the foundation for a rejection of Marxism, which was, uh, according to its proponents, uh, the proponents of the, this uh, view of state and civil society, uh, Marxism was extremely naive about the state or needed a strong state, which is not true. And uh, the, the sort of idealized view of civil society as if evil comes from the state and civil society is a place of innocence, et cetera. 
or at least free exchange and rationality. I mean, Habermas, for example, uh, in uh, his work on the public sphere is exactly that. And this notion, which, okay, it has a liberal variant, but it's not difficult to see how it could become uh, in, in the present circumstances, the, the, not that they're using the language, but the concepts are there and it becomes uh, an argument against uh, anything other than the most, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, greedy neoliberal regime because you, you have to leave uh, civil society alone, you have to leave commercial activity alone, you have to let people uh, engage in whatever activities they want to within very loose limits. And uh, that's essentially the ideology of the right wing. And, and the, they mobilize against, you know, what they call the deep state, the, the refusal of the state to relinquish the power that should be given to the people, including, we should keep this in mind, the power to punish and uh, execute people that are guilty of crimes, including uh, now, as proposed in Florida, crimes against property. Okay, that the, the gun owners uh, should have the right to shoot and kill people who commit crimes against property during uh, civil disturbances. Okay, so all the functions of the state are being ceded to individuals as if that's going to be a realm of freedom. And, and I think that that's part of a kind of reading of Gramsci that evolved over time that has very little to do with Gramsci's text. And I agree, we don't want to do a kind of uh, we don't have to do a you know very close reading uh, to get at every nuance, and there's an immense amount of material in Gramsci. But but I think when we when we look at the the you know the sort of relatively complete edition of the prison notebooks, and it's it's chronologically organized, uh, we can see that Gramsci has very little to do with the ideas uh, that Anderson and others and, and the Euro communists presented. That it, it's it's a much more it's what you would expect in certain ways. He's very concerned with ideas of strategy, and he's not uh, it's not a critique based on these formal models and that sort of thing. And Althusser, uh, you know, agreed with that. I mean, he he uh, rejected the opposition of state and civil society as a as something that would mislead us politically and uh, theoretically. Thank you. Uh, next is David Marzello. Great. Uh, thanks to all the presenters. And this is a question for, for both Nathan and Warren, um, kind of maybe trying to tie both of the papers together. Um, so the first question is maybe a little bit more towards Nathan. Um, so you, you obviously pick up on this language of rational empiricism in Althusser, um, which um, I find it in a way quite strange, not that you pick up on it, but that Althusser uses it just given how clear um, he typically seems to be about his just avoidance of the language of empiricism in general. So I, I wonder maybe why not go in a slight or in a slightly different direction, which is that um, Althusser and also Bachelard too, also uh, they both spoke about what they call rationalist materialism. Um, so there's the, the book by uh, Bachelard, Le, Mater Le, Materialisme, Le Materialisme Rationnel, um, and then also in a text that I think Warren translated a while back, which is the Althusser's introduction to uh, Mashray's uh, essay on Kangilem, um, he concludes by saying this. He says, um, Althusser says that there's uh, two kinds of rationalism. There's an idealist rationalism, but then he says that Lenin figured out that there's also a materialist uh, uh, rationalism as well. And it's maybe one of the first places where he starts to have a more positive invocation um, uh, of Lenin's sort of philosophical writings. Um, so that was kind of my, my first thought. And then the second was just generally, just because it came across both papers, is just the sort of status of Althusser's rationalism. Um, I think he's typically thought to, um, I think he's typically criti criticized from people, you know, as early as um, Rossier and also, um, and also Perry Anderson, but also up into the present um, for being sort of crudely rationalist, um, thinking that the exposure of the masses to Marxist science simply dissipates their false ideas and, and to problem solved. Um, but it seems to me that if you read the text closely, he actually says precisely the opposite. Um, he endorses a kind of weak rationalism, um, which, I, which I sort of took to be what, what Warren was talking about um, in some sense, um, the, the way in which, um, or the way in which the sort of converse, is that, uh, converse side of that is that 
as Spinoza points out, the sort of false ideas um, uh, can be extremely powerful and extremely motivating. Um, and so the truth is, is often not sort of sufficient in and of itself to, um, to do much. Um, so as I see it, the problem for Althusser is how to integrate true ideas with um, some kind of practice. So anyway, just some sort of thoughts to link those two um, papers together. Yeah, I can, I can try to answer the question about rationalist empiricism. Um, so it is indeed for me extremely important to, um, to think about that in a materialist way. But uh, what's so bizarre about his use of the term in that 1965 essay is that he, he says he's analyzing these different elements in the theoretical conjuncture and he gets to rationalist empiricism and he says that there are two varieties of it. And what's interesting about this is that the first one is materialist rationalist empiricism. And there he means something like, he refers to something like psychophysiology or something. He means a kind of like reductive what we would now think of as like an eliminativist materialism that he's rejecting. And then he says, there's also an idealist rationalist empiricism, which has produced the more interesting results. And this is what he then links to French epistemology of science. And he says that it's saved the honor of French philosophy after the terrible spiritualist reaction of the 19th century. And so it's, it's uh, this tradition, you know, moving through. Um, and, and so why is it idealist? idealist rationalist empiricism. To tell you the truth, I really don't know quite what he means by that. And I don't think that he really knows what he means by it either because he never returns to this vocabulary, he drops it. But I do engage with this in detail in the second chapter of my, my book and try to sort out what the stakes of it are. But for me, the stakes are, are as follows. Like my whole argument in the book is that you know, in the 20th, 21st century, we get this false opposition of critique and speculation. And that's what I'm trying to overcome by returning to the relationship between rationalism and empiricism. And what I think is at issue is, is uh, the relationship of contemporary philosophy and also Althusser perhaps to, to Kant, you know, because in Kant, we get transcendental critique. And uh, what has to be overcome, I think, is a transcendental perspective on critique. Um, I think that's what 21st century philosophy has right in terms of thinking about speculation. It just doesn't know, you know how to go about that. Um, but imminent critique, as opposed to transcendental critique is something actually that I think Althusser has in common with Hegel. This is Hegel's critique of Kant that we need an imminent critique rather than transcendental critique. And what's interesting is that the transcendental for Kant is what displaces the opposition of rationalism and empiricism. And so the, the question is, once you criticize the transcendental, you reopen the problem of the relationship between rationalism and empiricism. And that's exactly what Bachelard is trying to think through. Yes. And, uh, and, and Althusser takes this up from Bachelard and he doesn't really develop it. He doesn't know what to do with it. But what, so what I'm trying to do is in the book is like go back to Kant's relationship to Hegel's relationship to Kant and then think this through you know, the French epistemological tradition up to some developments in like Baudieu and contemporary French philosophy in a way that like takes this problem seriously. But the whole question is overcoming transcendental critique and moving to a mode of imminent critique, which is materialist rather than idealist as it is in Hegel. So that's, and everything depends on, you know, the relationship between the rational and the empirical ungrounded from the transcendental. So that's the problem of the, of the book. Yeah, I mean, I, oh, sorry. No. Okay, uh, I, I agree entirely. And I think uh, that, you know, Althusser ultimately, I mean, ha there's, there, there are quite, quite a few notes uh, in the archive on both Bachelard and even much more on Canguilhem. But um, I think his, his student, uh, Dominique Lecour, who wrote a number of things on Bachelard, what, what, what the Cour was able to do, and I think it's exactly the problem you're talking about, the, 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 it's, it's a rationalism that is, is uh, saved from a, ra a rationalist deviation by virtue of its materialism, okay? Meaning, and it, it is about uh, transcendence in many ways, meaning that Bachelard, for example, talks about regional rationalisms and the refusal to, you know, declare an overall Popperian kind of uh, essence of science or that, that uh, at a transcendental level that every uh, possible variant would somehow correspond to. Uh, 
he, he was, uh, Bachelard is the one, of course, who talks about the break or the rupture, et cetera. And uh, uh, both um, Althusser and Bukur, they saw this as, uh, as, as sort of um, a, a rationalism uh, whose transcendence is imminent within it, if you put it like that, that's a crazy way to put it, but it's something like that. And, and, and I think also the materialist element, because the, the idea of empiricism, I think it was troubling to Althusser at a certain point, uh, was connected with the idea of, what, what does he call it? Uh, uh, technical and instrumental materialism is what uh, Bachelard says. And, and so it's, it's not simply finding objects or, or forces or whatever as they exist in nature, but transforming uh, what is found almost like uh, the, the 1963 essay on materialist dialectic, transforming what is found through the use of instrumentation and technology that in, in some way makes it something other than itself in order to be understood. And for him, uh, that, or, and Bachelard talks about this in his book, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, not a guarantee, but it, it, it places, uh, it, it removes the kind of, uh, sort of immediate knowledge that they connected with uh, empiricism and, and uh, gives it uh, a knowability that in some way isn't the case with just objects that are found, et cetera. So I think, uh, I mean, uh, Lecour has a number of books uh, on Bachelard, which I think are very, uh, it's exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about. Not, I mean, he doesn't, I don't think he talks about transcendence exactly, but I think it's, precisely that problem that uh, at least Althusser and Lecour found uh, absolutely that, 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 uh, that Bachelard really in some way addressed it in a way that nobody else did in the sciences. And it's, you know, it's, it's the hard sciences or the physical sciences, whereas for Canguilhem could be a little more expansive. But I, I agree with you. And I think, I think that that's, that is something that's, you can find what you're talking about in Bachelard, absolutely. I think it's, it's uh, his hallmark in a way. Uh, and then what was the, I can't remember the other, the other question. It's kind of about the, the sort of weak rationalism in Althusser. So the awareness that the truth isn't efficacious. Uh, oh, okay. There, you know, you, I mean, it, it, the, the phrase <laughs> the always repeated was Machiavelli, la verità effettuale. So it, there's absolutely, I mean, Machiavelli, to, to have a true idea, you know, because Althusser said in his, in his interview with uh, Machiocchi in 1968, that uh, true ideas always serve the people and false ideas always serve the enemies of the people. Okay, but that isn't, it's not a given that that, that service is going to actually be provided and I think the, the Machiavellian element there is that the truth has to be in, not, not certified, which is the rationalist, uh, classical rationalist uh, approach, which is we have to authenticate or certify the certainty of the truth, that sort of thing, the Cartesian, et cetera, but, but rather to, uh, to impose it. it and, and by displacing everything that stands in the way of the apprehension of that truth, because, you know, as you like to say, that just the, the existence of the truth has no guarantee that that truth will be uh, felt or understood or even allowed to appear. And so it, it's the idea that even truth is caught up in, in the relationship of forces, and that you, if you're going to pursue that truth, that you're going to have to, you have to intervene politically, because no truth is going to come uh, you know, falling down from heaven or something like that. So I, I think it, it is, uh, and, and this is not something that he, I think initially he did, he thought, you know, uh, some, a more classical rationalist view. And uh, over time, as he became in many ways more attuned to struggle and all that, uh, because of what was going on around him, I think that uh, he, he changed his view. And I mean, like, if you look at the spontaneous philosophy of the scientists, uh, which I think is, a, is an incredibly interesting text that gets uh, overlooked many times. But that's, that's exactly what he's talking about. I mean, intervening, drawing a line of demarcation, opening a path, 
because if philosophy doesn't do that, and that's a struggle, I mean, it's a, it's a you know, it's the Leninist model, then it's not going to happen. And, you know, I mean, that's, there's no guarantee of the, of the, the final triumph of knowledge or truth or science. It, there, it could be uh, never uh, realized. That's absolutely possible for him. And, you know, uh, I think that's the one of the, uh, it's, it's disturbing in certain ways, but it's, I, I think it was disturbing to him in certain ways. But I think, you know, he came to that, re it's part of the aleatory materialism idea, which is not against uh, scientific knowledge. I mean, it's just, it, it's a recognition that just like capitalism might not have happened, well, guess what? Galileo might, might not have happened in some way. And you, there's, you know, that's not going to just happen by virtue of, you know, the, the logic of the idea or something in, in the Hegelian sense. So I, I think that's, it's very important for him. It's, it's, it's maybe, it sets him apart from virtually every other Marxist, I would say, and, you know, in a good way. Thank you. Uh, so I have, we have a question in the queue from Tanzine. And then we'll have Alejo have the honor of giving the last question of the conference. Um, unless Alejo, do you want to go first? Uh, Tenzi needs a couple minutes. Sure, I, I can do that. I won't have the honor of going last. Uh, I got to say, this Sorry. has far exceeded our, our expectations. And I'm, I'm really just uh, joyful in, in a sense. Uh, our potentia has been increased, uh, uh, most definitely. By this encounter, uh, I'll try to be brief, and it kind of builds nicely on kind of David's uh, point um, uh, about weak rationalism. Um, and the question is directed to you, uh, Warren. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things that we've seen in the past year, uh, certainly here in Michigan, is this kind of maybe uh, weird sort of um, strange bedfellows by certain comrades in the left with the right. As it concerns the question of science, right, and 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 maybe we can call a kind of radical skepticism about science uh, in the left. Um, and it seems to me that the left has kind of abandoned science um, to either the kind of idealist uh, empiricism of the kind of liberal types, like the March for Science, um, or just outright in the kind of radical skeptic uh, camp, right, which is probably where a lot of comrades are at uh, at this point. And so, kind of thinking about to say, right. Um, if we think precisely of this Althusser of like class struggle and theory that I think we're just pointing to, right? If philosophy by tracing line of demarcations and sort of stating pieces, taking positions, um, I think as Althusser says, uh, aims to produce effects in political practice, but also in scientific practice, right? So in that sense, maybe operates as a kind of relay, right? As a kind of maybe conveyor belt even. Uh, precisely thinking about this kind of weak rationalism that you're just pointing out, right? The truth just isn't efficacious on its own, as it were. Um, you have to intervene politically. Uh, how, you know, what do you think the role would be then? Or how, how, how are you thinking, sorry, my guy's trying to, what, what are you thinking uh, the role might be uh, in terms of political intervention in relation to science in this conjuncture, right? Um, do not fall you know, either to a kind of idealist empiricism, right? Which would merely state, you know, um, I believe in science as liberals like to do, um, and which also sometimes gets close to that position. I mean, I'm, I'm, be, I'm being, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, a bit facetious about this here, but how, 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 how might you think about uh, possible interventions, right, in relation to, to the right? Yeah, I mean, it's a very good question because I, I just having read, um, I, I wrote the preface for this uh, book by uh, uh, Clemente that I mentioned on uh, educate, and education. And in 1954, which I don't even know this essay, but in 1954, he wrote an essay that it kind of it approaches what you're saying, where um, it's quite funny because he says all, I mean, I'm paraphrasing and caricaturing, but he says like, all this existentialist crap, you know, it's just like this literary, uh, I don't even know what it means, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we're defending true scientific, not really scientific truth. And, you know, we're, we're about science and all that. And, uh, you know, he obviously, he, he modified his position, uh, as I said, uh, be, in many ways because of the students. And he, it, it even affected his view of science. And, and I think it wasn't just Monod. He talks about the biologist Jacques Monod, uh, 
but but you know other he he witnessed for example the extraordinary exploitation as he puts it of of science by you know especially the science of genetics which was just emerging in the 60s uh, by all kinds of extraneous uh, interests and you know you can uh, ridiculous things and uh, and so I, I think at that point and then also just not not having such a crude view that it's good science and bad you know philosophy or something but he began to see that what what was called science was in fact this composite that was made up in part of philosophy slash ideology and you know actual uh, scientific discoveries etc and he rejected the Popperian you know court of law where you judge each uh, theory but, but so so how, how is he qualified to make any kind of intervention well, the answer is he's more qualified than a scientist to identify the philosophical residue or presence in the arguments of the scientist who doesn't even know that he's repeating and appropriating these ideas that are floating around. And so it's, it's the philosopher who can draw that line of demarcation and say, okay, I, I can't tell you about the discoveries that you're talking about, but I can isolate every single one of the ideological or, or previously philosophical elements that in fact are unrelated to and may even be a counter to your discovery. And so uh, it, it, in a sense, he's redefining what we mean by science and it becomes the place of a conflict, of a, a struggle, of contradiction. And the, and the philosopher, in the way that he's talking about it, is not going to make statements about th this is true or false. He's going to draw that line of demarcation, and he may be wrong, okay, we'll find out. Draw a line of demarcation that separates the, 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 the scientific discoveries in the strict sense from any kind of overlay or even relatively innocent use of other philosophical doctrines, which you see all the time. I mean, science is filled with appeals to idiotic uh, philosophical theory, even though the sciences are right. And, um, and so I think it, it's, it's that sort of reconsideration of what we mean by science and by the practice of science, because it too is never pure. And so this is the, this is the role, this is one of the roles of the philosopher. And that, unfortunately, that, that work and that moment uh, of his uh, which was expressed in a, a rather dogmatic way. It was, it was shoved aside by the events, which are, you know, good events. Of, uh, we should all have such bad events as May 68 or something. But I mean, it, it, it was pushed aside in favor of a more political direction. But I, that's why I think it's worth going back to the spontaneous philosophy uh, of the scientists as a text to, to look at that practice. And, and I think it, it, in, in some way, it's his theorization of what both Bachelard in his way and Canguilhem in his way, and even maybe Cavalier's uh, in some way, are doing. That when they look at uh, the sort of philosophies that envelop science, they end up drawing this line of demarcation, even though they don't think in those terms. And I think uh, that that's it's very valuable. And you know, obviously, you can see the cost of some rejection of science, quote unquote, which is absurd in some way. I mean, you'll end up uh, on the wrong side. I mean, you end up uh, becoming a spokesperson for neoliberalism that would love to dispense with so, some of these demands uh, for medical treatment and things like that. And there, there's a long discussion about that. But um, I, I think that's it's very, very important to go back to some of his uh, theses on on science and the role of philosophy in relation to science yeah, i just want to i want to jump in quickly i mean i completely agree with the importance of of what warren just said i mean so for one thing i mean that spontaneous philosophy of the scientist essay for me that's the most important text by lt Serre, mm -hmm. and uh you know, I just think it's so crucial and really is the linchpin of, of everything that he's doing but then the second thing i just want to agree with is, is that yeah, this is really a question about philosophy, not about science, because like, it's obvious in a certain way that like, to everyone, even if they take up different positions on it, that like, it's important that we know science that you know, the science of global warming, etc. All these people who are referring to the Anthropocene, at the same time, they're against like, whatever they think scientific objectivity is, or 
they're against like, you know, we, we see that these, criti these criticisms of science, they come from a position of radical ignorance with right. respect to the history of philosophy. And that's the problem because they're all bound up with the rejection of it, the enlightenment, right. of, um, of Eurocentrism, uh, of the subject object duality of dualism. <laughs> you know, these people have no idea what they're talking about. So that, so that for example, they don't even seem to know that within enlightenment philosophy, there's like a wide range of opposing and like conflictual positions on these questions. One would think that all enlightenment philosophers agree that there's a dualism of subject and object and that science is like an objectivity from which the subject is like, I mean, this is how people speak, you know? So it's a question actually of like, of reading <laughs> philosophy so that one can orient oneself to knowledge in general. I mean, science is not, you know, obviously it's a specific form of, of knowledge which is revisable because it's rigorous and therefore can be revised. But, um, but really the problem is the relationship to philosophy. And it's a problem also for Marxists, I have to say, because there are so many Marxists, many of whom I know quite well, who think that like, you know, now that we have Marx, we don't need to read philosophy you know, because we're, it's like, how did Marx become Marx? It's by reading philosophy, you know? Uh, so learning how to think, you know, is, is the key to like thinking about science. It, it, in a way it has nothing to do with science. Um, so, yeah. Well, I, I think you're right. And I think that, uh, for example, I've seen not as, as much anymore, but I saw a lot of uh, the use of Foucault to, uh, which is not at all what Foucault's own views were. I mean, he wrote a very appreciative you know, review essay of Monod's uh, work on genetics. And we think it was, you know, some kind of uh, uh, just the exercise of power, something like that. And uh, you, you, you do see these. I mean, I, I'm, I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little bit hopeful that the, the nature of the pandemic, et cetera, has made it more difficult for people just to say, I think it's all bullshit, you know, if they, I mean, people do, obviously. But I think, at least on the left, it's harder. I think, and uh, uh, you know, it, it, I don't think it's that difficult to dissociate the science from attempts to exploit it or deny it or whatever on, on the part of uh, the right, which you know is, is into full denial mode of virtually all these things. But I, you know, I agree with you, and I think uh, it's, it's a ridiculous position uh, that. Is going to be a real impediment in the future. I mean, with global warming and pandemics, I mean, you can't, you just can't ignore that stuff. So, anyway. For sure. Could I just ask Warren real quick, what is the text from the 84 that you mentioned, Clemente? Oh, uh, uh, Clemente, it, it hasn't come out yet. Uh, it's a, a manuscript. Well, the provisional title was uh, the, the scholarly, or however you translate it. Uh, scholarly apparatus or, or uh, educational apparatus. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's an extraordinary thing. It shows, for, among other things, the intense uh, discussions between Althusser and um, uh, Bourdieu. Uh, Bourdieu and uh, Passeron, and uh, Bourdieu and Darbel earlier. Who were doing things on the school at the very, you know, in the early 60s, perhaps. And they were there and they worked with Althusser, and there was a lot of tension and everything. And, but what's fascinating is the students were pissed off at both of them, at both camps, and felt like, you know, this is like a the same old, same old way of talking about things, blah, blah, blah. And so they felt that the critique of the school was uh, you know like ignoring uh, in their own practice the critique that in some ways they, they admitted. I mean, and it led to a deepening of the analysis. There's that. I mean, they're they're all. He looks at at um, various essays that Althusser wrote. They're not that many, but they're they're pretty interesting. But then finally, that project between '68 and '72 on education that was Althusser, Balibar, Machere. Uh, um, uh, the two uh, people, uh, Estabve and uh, Boudelot, who wrote a book in French, actually, that came out of it, on education. And the ISA's essay was part of that, and maybe there's more that Altisir did. Uh, 
Valley Bar wrote to quite a bit on that, actually. Uh, and he, and uh, Clemente looks at these, these unpublished manuscripts in Mashre, Valley Bar, et cetera. And so it's, it's, a, it's a, I mean, it's just, it's a really, really interesting study. I mean, it may not, I don't know if people will find the title interesting or I mean the topic, but it really gives you insight into Althusser. I, 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 you know, I know Althusser really well. I didn't dream of uh, these kinds of things. And I didn't know that much about the student and the general strike of students in 1963. I didn't know about that. And I even, I wrote uh, like an introduction to the 64 essay, Student Problems, which was focused on a very specific thing, but I think I, I underestimated the effect of the students on him. And that's important. He's, he's not just like cut off and didn't you know, listen to his uh, you know, students. Or something. I mean, it's, his whole life is the opposite of that. I mean, the students who worked with him, but also the ones he didn't even like, like some of these students who didn't love him, who were, you know, revolting against him. But he ended up absorbing their ideas. You know, and he, it was partly the model of the Cultural Revolution and the place of university reform and all that. And the, the critique of the division of labor is a huge thing for him at that time. And uh, he read, I mean, for example, if you look at his library, he read things by Krupskaya, Lenin's uh, companion, uh, on education and technical schools and all, it was incredible. I mean, I never dreamed that he was that, uh, I mean, he was immersed in the stuff, which makes sense. I mean, that was his life. I mean, that was his livelihood. But it, it, it shows, um, it, it, it just deepens our understanding of, of how his thought developed and how he was influenced by other forces, not just reading or something, but, you know, actually the movements and, and it wasn't an easy process. It's not like they had a strike and you said, oh, that's great, you know, I'm on your side. It was resisting and then, you know, talking bad about them. And then finally, even though he hated the people, he ended up adopting their ideas, which is, you know, that's the way it works often. Thank you. Uh, so Alex has a quick plug uh, regarding this conference and its origins, and then we'll turn it to Tanzine for uh, their series of questions to finish things off, if that's good. Yes, I don't, I certainly don't want to interrupt the discussion, um, which is very lively and, and exciting, but I think that, that Warren, your last point, touches upon the, the, something that I think we've been trying to do in this reading group, which is to create a set of conditions or to seize upon a set of conditions to like kind of break down the barriers between the division of labor between intellectuals and militants and um, the university discourse and the wider discourse on the left. Um, and so I just want to say before we lose any more participants to just like attrition, um, I would like to encourage you all to um, follow the reading group. Um, the best way to do that is by joining our Slack group. Um, where we'll be distributing, you know, updates about um, future iterations of this reading group will probably be beginning uh, its second phase uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, and the tentative plan is to begin sort of chronologically reading uh, on the reproduction of capitalism, um, along with other texts from the sort of second half of the 1960s. So, you know, just to say like, if you're interested in this project, if you've enjoyed this conference, um, please do, you know, reach out, get involved and stay in touch so that we can keep building this community of, you know, this collective intellectuality that we've, uh, that we're able to make happen in this sort of virtual space. Um, this, yes, this idlet of communism uh, as Alejo reminds us, right? Um, but yeah, that's what we're trying to build. Um, and all, everybody is welcome to partake and participate. Uh, and we welcome everybody. So um, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to all of our presenters and participants. And I'm sorry to interrupt the, the flow of the conversation, but um, 
but thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Alex. And before I read uh, Tanzin's questions, um, I would just like to reiterate, you know, the great eyelid of communism to use uh, Paniotis' term from this morning, um, that is for this reading group, um, you know, I met a great set of friends and comrades on uh, the bi-monthly meetings to sit down and discuss Althusser's text in such a lively manner is, is kind of a highlight of uh, the past year, which brought a lot of changes and uncertainties and uh, difficulties. Um, so I will read Tanzin's questions. Um, so first, Adrian talked about uh, late Lukacs and the significance of reduction. And he thinks, and he wants to talk about real reduction, but I'm also wondering more about how reduction happens and affects differently for different subjects. Uh, this is particularly important because of positionality, uh, not identity of subjects, uh, which are determined by history. So the way a slave is reduced is quite different from the way a worker is reduced. In fact, the very possibility uh, for the worker to be reduced and the possibility for his freedom is tied to the unfreedom and complete reduction of the slave. Um, how do you think about capitalist reduction um, and the pragmatic difference with uh, Nathan's process of separation? Uh, the second is for Warren um, with your uh, discussion of the importance of taking the far right seriously. Uh, but Tanzin thinks it fails to see how the struggle of the left and right for many um, is really an internal struggle inside white supremacy, or one could say the struggle of left and right makes the given political spectrum more robust. How does one think about, how do you think about this problem? And then for Nathan, I like the presentation. I am interested in understanding how separation as a concept displaces Marxist humanism of alienation. Uh, but given Marxist deep philosophical reliance on humanism, isn't this focus on separation to make Marx non-humanist is sort of bypassing the problem instead of actually confronting the very humanist basis of the his conceptualization of labor and alienation. Thanks. Okay, well, I'm just, I'll address the two questions, but um, I'm going to take that first, the last question first. I mean, yeah, uh, the you know everything in Althusser, everything in Althusser ultimately. This is why, I like you know, my if I if I would take issue with certain things in in Adrian's presentation is because you know Althusser is saying these things, you know, but what do they mean, you know? So when Warren says like ah, it's not really about like Gramsci, I mean, I agree with that, you know. It's like the the stakes of these things are not necessarily like what's actually being said, but rather his positioning in relation to somebody else. So the whole humanist controversy, I mean, has to be thought of in that way. Uh, insofar as I'm theoretical anti-humanist also, like with respect to Marx, it's because I think that, um, of course, it's, it's not that there are no humanist elements of, of Marx, which are legible in the chapters on the labor process, et cetera. It's just that, it's just that um, uh, the humanism of the early Marx is a, uh, or of Marx in general, in the early period operates as an epistemological obstacle to, to the formation of an adequate system of concepts. You know, that's the problem. And actually one can see it very clearly if you just take out is humanism good or bad, you know, and you just look at the way the concept of alienation works and functions. It's not that it doesn't specify something which is extremely important. It definitely does. It's just that it like it subsumes you know, or it, well, that's a too technical term almost, but it like gets in the way of, because of its primacy, the development of other concepts that operate in different ways, like separation. So that's what I'm trying to show. And it's not, it's not so much like, uh, you know, anti-humanism operates in a different way with respect to my own relationship, let's say to like liberalism or other forms of humanism that I think it's important to combat in a contemporary context. And that's why I, you know, it's valuable to me. But with, with Marx, it's a question of like, when is it operating as an epistemological obstacle? And when is it not? 
So in capital, in, in, in capital, we can say there are still humanist elements. There are still elements of, we can still think about the category of species being in a sophisticated way. It's just that it's no longer functioning as an epistemological obstacle. It doesn't have to be thrown out. And that's why it's important to acknowledge, yeah, he uses the term alienation, but something has happened at the level of a, of a systematic displacement. Um, secondly, uh, your question about, well, okay. So your question about separation in relation to, um, different forms of um, domination, let's say, uh, the constitution of subjects. So my, the chapter on the analytic of separation ends with a whole section on the proletariat. I mean, Tanzine, you've read my, you've read my essay on the proletariat and that, that section of it, you know, tries to think of the proletariat as a separated class, you know, so we can analyze the distinction between different forms of exploitation or different forms of domination, different forms of power as they operate on social subjects that have to do with, um, with we could say the figure of the slave or that have to do with like blackness or that have to do with like um, uh, with uh, sex and gender that have to do with the, with the um, and with social reproduction. And so we can, you know, so I try to say that actually the analytic of separation is a way of analyzing divisions that are internal to the proletariat and thinking about the different logics of exploitation or logics that are exterior to exploitation in the capitalist sense that are operative within the, within the class um, and thinking about the, the class in a processual way, also class composition in a way that constantly has to be historicized and thought through its, its divisions. Um, you know, I would just say, finally, I mean, uh, this would be a longer conversation to have with Assad, you know, but, um, you know, I mean, Assad wrote this book on identity politics, like, and I, and it's not that I, I agree with the critique of liberal identity politics, it's just that I, I don't think that, <clears throat> like, I don't think that one can sort of, like, insist, <laughs> like, that, you know, we have to reject these, like, you know, of course, we, we have to criticize liberal identity politics, but we, but I think that the, like the radicalism of, of black nationalist currents that run through Malcolm X, that run through Baraka, you know, these things can't be written off as things that they just got over, even if they themselves do that. You know, and I think that, and I think that um, it's very important in thinking about so-called Afro-pessimism, or at least Wilderson, that we uh, take very seriously the fact that this is not a form of liberal identity politics at all that it's a structural analysis of forms of domination that are at once interior to and in a way like that have a different logic than the logic of capitalist exploitation. And I think that we get nowhere by just polemicizing. We have to think through the relationship of that to Marxism in a way that integrates some of its results and its own criticisms of liberal identity politics. I take it that that entire discourse is a critique of liberal, liberal identity politics. And so, you know, I would just take up slightly different, let's say, like tactical relationship to these discourses than Assad does, even though I completely agree with his critique of, of liberal identity politics. And so I think, Tenzin, your question is partly coming from that perspective. And in the, in the larger chapter, I have a section on the proletariat where I try to think through it. Uh, should I respond? Just to add, sorry, I had background noise and that's why I had written those questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to add, the first question was actually for Adrian. I wanted to use Nathan's idea of separation to kind of help Adrian with this notion of reduction, which uh, lacked a certain kind of detail, which I wanted in that reduction model. So I agree that there is reduction. I just don't agree that reductions are similar. And I think some forms of reduction um, um, are actually, uh, and that's why I brought up the whole question of the worker and, and other kinds of subject positions whose reduction and consequent uh, uh, freedom, et cetera, still relies on the social death and gratuitous violence of, of black subjects or, and so on. So, and the other thing is the economistic reading uh, there. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I agree with that also, but uh, no amount of economics can tell me uh, precisely why it can tell me why there are needs for things like Abu Ghraib, but it doesn't tell me the kind of treatment and manner of killing and violence that would happen inside it. No materialism will actually explain that detail to me. And so this is precisely why 
if a subject of who's an enemy combatant or a terrorist subject for them, this question of reduction uh, requires a, a lot more detail than simply stating that there is reduction. Does Just, that make sense? I, I, to follow that up, I mean, I thought you can come back, but like, I think that's a key thing about Althusser's contribution and the theory of overdetermination that, um, and, the, and the early critique of economism. And, that's, and it's also the key element of Althusser's relationship to psychoanalysis, which I think is crucially repeated then by, this is something I think which is really not understood in um, the way that people evaluate, particularly Wilderson, that he's dealing with like unconscious phantasms, you know, that like act upon certain social subjects and not others. And, you know, and this psychoanalytic dimension of, um, of Wilderson's work is extremely important if we want to understand what the hell is going on. You know, when like, when like cops say the things that they do about Michael Brown, for example. So there has to be some analysis precisely of like the relationship of that, which is something very different. I agree with you, no Marxist analysis can tell us anything about that, you know? And, um, and I just think that has to be folded in without saying like, therefore we reject Marxism, that would be insane. You know, so it's like uh, right, right. determination is precisely, you know, the way of thinking about um, those issues, I think. So there is an Althusserian like dimension to that problem. Yeah. As far as your, your uh, uh, presentation, Nathan, I, I agree with it. But my, my issue there is perhaps you and I look at Marx's philosophical uh, uh, dimension differently. Maybe I, I'm too dismissive of all the things he basically borrowed from. Uh, liberalism and so on, and then became an economic counter-economic reader in many ways, and the, the Feuerbach dependency. All of that is deeply informing Marx in the way he thinks about labor, etc. And so, I guess the only thing I would, and I didn't read your uh, that part of the book yet, so I have to read your book to understand it properly. So I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm I'm doing a bad kind of reduction here of, of how you read this stuff. But I guess my my worry or concern would be is to not simply judge Marx as humanist or non-humanist. Uh, I'm less interested in that, but trying to understand the humanist contribution to actually critique uh, the humanism, if that, if that makes sense. So, so if, if we have to truly engage with, with the, 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 hum, the anti-humanist potential, then we have to first understand and kind of agree with Marx's general sets of assumptions in relation to labor and so on. It's particularly related because you know, later on, there's been some political conversations about what to do, etc. And a lot of those conversations, no one can actually answer the question that there's a bunch of metaphysical assumptions of Marx, which is about why they want to do what they want to do. And it's precisely these metaphysical assumptions, what it is that makes us human in the first place, or different types of humans. So the, the very orientation requires this kind of engagement, basically. What yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I just think that, that Althusser, he solves a very particular problem. The, the reasons that I'm an anti-humanist are different. But the, but the, um, but I would just say, like, I don't know what people think of the book, but you know, I think that Martin Hagelin's book is an extremely important uh, take on how the problem of freedom runs throughout the entirety of Marx's career. And although there are many things I don't agree with in in Hagelin's book, it forced me to reconsider the question of um, of the centrality of of the category of freedom throughout Marx's oath. And I think he makes an extremely compelling case and sort of an ideological decontamination of the category of species being, which is super important in chapter four of that book. So I would point people to the second half of that book, uh, even if I don't completely follow the whole line of argumentation. I gotta go pretty see it's like uh, maybe, but Assad, I do, I, I mean, you should you should reply. Yeah. yeah, I think I was interpolated and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, one thing I want to say, it's not, true that capitalism is economically reductionist. That is false, I believe, because, and I, Gramsci is, is a, a good place to turn to understand why. Why is this? Because there is no direct uh, translation between the domination of capital in the production process in the economy to its political domination in the state. And what Gramsci, you know, we, we confuse ourselves by thinking in terms of schemas like base and superstructure. The, the problem is actually that the, the leadership of the dominant class has to be actually constructed. And 
These processes of leadership are what Gramsci is describing with hegemony. It's not a theory of culture, you know, you get into the stuff about coercion and consent. The problem is about how is it that the political leadership of the capitalist class is established? Because there's no spontaneous sense in which that will simply happen. And uh, so that's very important. So it's, it's not true that uh, reduction is a useful way to understand capitalism. And we can, we can you know, we can look at neoliberalism, for example, in this sense. And one, the, the great insight of Foucault about neoliberalism is that this is a project of social engineering. It's a, this is a state-driven project. This is a project of governance that uh, human life organized according to market relations. There's nothing natural about this. If you, if you think that neoliberalism is just the retreat of the state, then you think that there's something spontaneous about social life, which just leads to market relations. That's not true. They, they are designed, they are constructed through political processes. So we always have to keep this in mind. And this is, this is the importance of politics, not as uh, an, an Althusser sometimes, just in the way that Marx will use Ricardian language, he'll use humanist language in capital, he talks about alienation capital. Sometimes Althusser will use structuralist language to talk about this, but that's not the point. That's not what, what's conceptually important. So I think I want to make that point first. Then um, I, I, continuing on, on this kind of point about the, again, the, this Gramscian theme of the autonomy of politics. I think that is how we have to understand black nationalism. Uh, I don't believe that black nationalism should be written off. Even, even if uh, Amiri Baraka is an example of someone who came to criticize his black nationalism through a conversion to Marxism Leninism. Uh, the, uh, but Malcolm X is a very different kind of figure who didn't belong to this whole development in uh, which you had cultural nationalism and then Marxism. I mean, let's be properly anti-humanist about black nationalism. Let's cut out the nationalism because that has a bunch of metaphysical assumptions. Let's, how about just black terrorism and go from there? Uh, terrorism? I think that they were right. Yeah, like an actual sets of actions, sets of I, acts that actually create a particular set of equation. And so I think on. that nationalism was a correct category because they were explicitly dealing with the fact of national oppression as a global phenomenon. And that was uh, the national question, the fundamental problem of global politics for the entire 20th century. And black nationalism was a part of this conception of the national question and was a very deep uh, insight into the way that the national question manifested in the United States. And uh, the idea of national self-determination was a fundamental principle of anti-imperialism that was adopted by all of these figures, Malcolm X and so on. Malcolm X is, a, is an example of someone who is theorizing politics in the sense that I, I was uh, describing earlier uh, with reference to Gramsci. I mean, this is someone who is thinking about global politics in this way. And so black nationalism was revolutionary in this period. Uh, if, if that is, doesn't come across clearly in my book, I, 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 I made an error there because black nationalism was fundamentally revolutionary. Uh, Afro-pessimism has nothing to do with black nationalism. It's complete, there's, there's, no, there's no idea of national self-determination in Afro-pessimism. And Afro-pessimism furthermore, it's, it's a humanist anti-humanism. It's not really anti-humanism. It's a conception of humanism, which then just provides a very superficial negation of it. So I think that we don't, we cannot speak of Afro-pessimism in terms of uh, black nationalism as a politics of self-determination. There's no self-determination advanced by Afro-pessimism. So I don't, I don't think that that uh, continuity is there. So the, 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 I, I hope that, that's I mean, we, can't, we can't go back and forth all night, but all I meant, but all I meant there is just, um, you know, you read the, the chapter on um, the second uh, chapter on cinema in the second half of uh, Red, White and Black, you know, I mean, the, the whole reference is the politics, the radical black politics of the late 60s and early 70s. That's Wilderson's politics. 
you know, so, so he's very much invested in that sequence of radical black politics. You don't want to call it black nationalism, fine. But, um, but that's his entire like reference and the entire reason for his critique of liberal identity politics. But, but so it's just a misprision, you know, to align that with, with liberal identity politics. And it's just, it's not a big deal. I mean, well, it is a big deal, but it's, uh, but it's not something we're going to agree on or something, you know? So it's, it's just a question of, um, of what, you know, he's situating himself in, in part of the black radical tradition. So I think the problem is when people say it has nothing to do with the black radical tradition, it flies in the face of the black radical tradition. The question is which black radical tradition, what are the internal divisions within the black radical tradition? And it's very obvious that Wilderson is basing his actual politics on the black radicalism of the late 60s and early 70s. And that's all I mean to point out. I, if, I, if I may, um, I mean, it poses a question which I think sort of cut between, well, which goes to some of the things that Assad and I and other people have been sort of thinking about and talking about is the idea of, of the sort of, uh, what is the word in Lazarus, the sort of like, like culmination and exhaustion of a political sequence. So like, like thinking about this relationship of, of Afro-pessimism to the Black radical tradition, right, it, it, it comes in a in a position of coming after it, right? And reflecting on it in order to sort of, but but without being internal to it. Um, and I mean, I guess the, the yeah, so that that's the sort of like local intervention. It's just the question of like whether, you know, even in our, in drawing upon a radical tradition which is not necessarily active, that may in its own right involve a certain mode of pessimism that refers back to it. Um, in the same way that we might look at the, um, the Marxist-Leninist tradition, right? In a sort of pessimistic light by virtue of its exhaustion Right, like it's like th th this is not a mode which we can inhabit. So what now? Right. Um, I re I apologize if that's if I yeah, I didn't want jumped to in. That. I didn't actually want to uh, debate the whole question about on nationalism. The only reason I would say is that both Fanon and Malcolm had rejected uh, nationalism as a very particularly limiting nation-state-based understanding of revolution. And my question was actually about positionality. So whether, uh, and it's not a homogenous thing that one or, or few people think, it's, it's a very specific line of thinking, which is about positionality and whether, and I think I agree with Assad on the economistic uh, reduction question. I think that critique is about how Adrian was talking about capitalism earlier. Uh, through Lukács and so on, I'm assuming. Um, but I like the idea of reduction, but I think, I think reduction happens. My, my main issue with all of this was that there are sets of assumptions that we have about politics in relation to Warren's um, uh, kind of explanation of how to orient oneself and in, in oneself in politics that assumes a priori that there's going to be some sort of um, sets of common assumptions among subjects. And, and that's where I have a problem because I think that's an assumption because depending on positionality, it's unclear whether uh, there is such a uh, kind of coherent model of politics that's possible given that the, the way subjugation and servitude work, they work quite differently, even though there is sort of an interaction between the two. And that's really my point. And I think uh, the idea of separation helps there. That's the thing that Nathan was trying to say. I think it actually helps us understand these different uh, domains of history and having this interlinking, but at the same time, a very deep contestation that may not be in a satisfactory way uh, uh, politically resolved because some of these are political in some ways and, and, and tapes, but before even uh, the political theater is created. So we've already kind of participated in this conversation of politics and, uh, and my questions were actually prior to that. So, so that's really where I want to go with this.
perfect. Thank you, uh, Tanzine. Um, at this point, um, it's almost 11 here on the East Coast and we've been going for uh, about three and a half hours. So thank you very much to everyone who's uh, participated and uh, to uh, our speakers, uh, Warren Montag, Nathan Brown, and Asad Haider, who are here now, and then our guest speakers from earlier today, uh, Penny Otis-Satiris, uh, Vittorio Morfino, Natalia Brome, uh, Adrian Johnson, and Robin Rasco. It's uh, been a wonderful philosophical encounter, but I think it's time for this to be at a close. Um, it was a great pleasure and honor um, to host wonderful interpreters of Altizer and political thinkers in their own right. Um, so I think it's time to say good night and thanks again, everyone. <laughs>